I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. In accordance with Standing Order 55, I table a letter from the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Wong, on behalf of the majority of senators requesting me to summons the Senate to meet today. In light of the recent tragedy in Queensland, I wish to make a statement at the first opportunity of our meeting in the Senate today. On Monday, two police officers reported to duty and they never came home. Constable Matthew Arnold and Constable Rachel McCrow paid the ultimate sacrifice to keep our community safe. They served with honour and bravery. To neighbour, Mr Alan Dare, who simply came to help but tragically lost his life, he too will be remembered as a hero. To the families and friends of the victims, and the police community as a whole, we are grieving with you. We are indebted to our police officers and emergency service personnel who every day go to work risking their lives to serve and protect our communities. As a mark of respect to the memory of Constable Matthew Arnold, Constable Rachel McCrow and Mr Alan Dare, I ask all senators to join in a moment of silence. Thank you, Senator, Senator Gallagher. Oh, beg your pardon. I'll just yeah. sorry, Senator Gallagher. I'll do leave of absence first, Senator Urquhart. Um, thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator I move that leave Urquhart. of absence be granted to the following senators for today: Senators Wong and Farrell on account of ministerial business, and Senators Brown, Green, and Sheldon for personal reasons. Thank you, Senator Askew. <coughs> Move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Askew. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senators Birmingham and Chandler for the 15th of December for a parliamentary delegations, and Senators Molan, Payne, Hughes, Hume, Patterson, Bragg and O'Sullivan for the 15th of December for personal reasons. Thank you, Senator Askew. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator McKim. Thanks, President. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senators Steele, John, Rice, Wish Wilson, Thorpe, and Barbara Pocock for 15 December for personal reasons. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Roberts. I move that uh, thank you. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Hanson for the 15th of December for personal reasons. Uh, I'll now put the question on all of those motions about leave of absence. So the question is that those motions be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. Um, I just seek to update the chamber that in the absence of Senator Wong. 
uh, today who is uh, absent on parliamentary business um, and ministerial business, um, that I am the acting leader of the government in the Senate. Thank you. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I advise the Senate that Senator Birmingham will also be absent from the Senate today due to shadow ministerial business overseas. And in his absence, I will be the acting leader of the opposition in the Senate. Thank you, Senator Cash. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business for today. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not being granted, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in the name of Senator Wong, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the uh, consideration of the motion uh, to provide that a motion relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business may be moved immediately and determined uh, without amendment or debate. Although, with <laughs> although uh, may be moved immediately. Yes. Uh, thank you. And uh, I would like to begin by thanking uh, the Senate for uh, coming back for and having this urgent uh, sitting of the Senate uh, so soon after we adjourned for the year. It is important that the Senate consider the bills that are being passed by the House of Representatives today and that we deal and that we deal with this today. And it is no surprise, it is no surprise that those opposite are using a procedural motion to avoid debating these bills today. These bills are about saving uh, jobs. Minister, now, please resume your seat. Senator Hanson Young. Oh, point of order. Point, point order. Of, Senator McKenzie, I've got a senator on her feet with a point of order. Senator Hanson Young. Point of order, uh, Madam President. Um, even with the microphone on, I couldn't hear the minister speaking. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. It was my intention to call the senators to order. I would ask that this debate be heard in silence. Please continue, Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Because these bills today that are coming before the Senate as urgent bills that must be being dealt with today are about saving Australian industry and business. They're about saving Australian manufacturing. Uh, Minister Gallagher, They're about please saving Australian I have just asked the Minister to sit, and I ask Senators that the debate be heard in silence. And the minute the minister was called back to her feet, the interjection started. They are disorderly and disrespectful. Minister. Thank you, President. And they're about supporting cost of living pressures for Aust Australian families, for households, for individuals that are struggling under these increases in the cost of energy. Now, we are here, and we the government has been working on this and a solution for some of these cost increases for the last couple of months. After a wasted decade, we hear the laughter over there. We hear the laughter. The reason we are here dealing with this is because of an illegal invasion of Ukraine. An illegal invasion of Ukraine and 10 years of dysfunction, denial and the failure of those opposite on energy Order. policy. They are the two reasons we Minister are here. Minister Gallagher, please res resume your seat. Order. Order. Uh, thank you, Senator Canavan and Senator Watt. Calling out across the chamber is disorderly. We have a minister on her feet. I'm going to ask you again to listen. Please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, um, President. Now, I hear those laughing over there, but last Friday the Prime Minister struck an agreement with every state and territory government in Australia, governments of, diff of different political persuasions, Senator McGrath. governments that are responsible for dealing with issues as they arise, who understand the pressure that businesses, industry and households are under, and see the urgency behind these reforms that we are bringing forward. Now they are from all sides of politics. They see it, and here we have this mob over here on the wrong side of history. Order. And we will remember this. Don't you forget. We will remember this. Your names Order. recorded in Hansard. Each and every one of you who are going to stand in the way of support for industry, support for jobs, 
support for small business uh, and Senator support Gra for households. Let, you, let us Senator Gallagher, forget. please resume your seat. Once again, I've had to call the Senate to order. I would ask that the senator be heard in respectful silence. Senator, please continue. What you're seeing from this government responding through this legislative reform package today is a responsible government that has sat down and worked across the table with industry, with different stakeholders, with state and territory governments to actually provide some urgent solutions with a longer-term reform package, working across the parliament, talking Senator with Bang. different senators and members of parliament about the right thing to do to bring forward this package. And you over there don't even want to debate it. You're not even going to give leave for us to bring these bills forward to, be, uh, to debate them today. We're going to see this. I, have, I can predict over the next few hours we are going to have all the process arguments in the world raised. We're going to have, oh, we didn't get this and we didn't get that. But they will avoid the fact that when they vote in opposition to these bills, they will be voting for higher power prices and for no cost of living relief for households and for business. That is what you will be Senator voting Star. for if Senator you choose Star. to continue on this path today. This is an urgent sitting. This is urgent to deal with this, to avoid the big price increases. 22 failed energy policies. That is your record. And now you're going to try and stop us implementing one here today. That is what you're all Senator about. Scott, Opposition refusing to deal with the challenges. Head in the sand. Head in the sand, Senator McGrath. That's where you like it. Avoid the issues. Don't deal with them. Don't support households. Don't support industry. Don't support business. That is the position that you are taking today. Well, over here, we Order. want to work with the parliament. We want to provide solutions. We want to work with Australian businesses, with manufacturers. We want to take the pressure off households. We want to deal with the challenges that we're seeing, the energy crisis that we inherited from you. And you can't hide and avoid this decision today. No matter how hard you try, you are going to vote and you're going to be on the wrong side of history. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Order. Order. Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Madam President. And colleagues, I hope Senator Gallagher gets the irony of the statement she just made today in the Senate. Given that we're in opposition, this was one of Senator Gallagher's favourite quotes. The Senate must stand up for itself. Well, I thought that's what you were all doing. That's what you were all doing. It cannot become, colleagues, a patsy for the government. Well, guess why we're here today, people? Literally, those on that side of the chamber and the Australian Greens, a patsy for the government. But it gets better, colleagues. It gets better. The Senate is meant to be here as a check on executive power. Oh, good night. The irony of the motion. The irony of the, mo the motion today. This is a role that we are asked to do. But it gets worse because then she talks about, Senator Gallagher, our job descriptions. To fulfil our role in this place, we must stand up for proper process. Oh! For proper process. And then she finishes it off with this. We cannot continue to have this chamber used as a rubber stamp for government. Bang! At 4.30 today, a rubber stamp for this government. You come in here seeking to move a motion that the hours of meeting be from 1 p.m. until adjournment. And then, colleagues, you read further down. You know, it's all adjournment. I think, well, that's fair enough. We could sit till midnight. And then you get to part C, Senator Colby. If by 4.30pm consideration of the bill has not concluded, well, let me tell you, consideration of this bill will not be concluded because on this side of the chamber, all of my colleagues would like to speak. Senator Carr wants to speak. Senator Colbert wants to speak. Senator Henderson wants to speak. And guess what? They can't. They can't because you are gagging debate on this particular bill. You are gagging debate. We need to get into committee stage as soon as possible. Please resume your seat. Once again, the interjections are disorderly. And I would ask that Senator Cash be heard in silence. Please continue, Senator Cash.
Thank you very much, Madam President. And I have to say again, in Senator Gallagher's comments, she referred to the Senate being here today to consider the bill. Well, the last time I checked, consideration of a bill meant you don't get it 24 hours beforehand. Not even that. We got it nine hours beforehand. Nine hours beforehand. One of the greatest interventions in the energy market that this country has ever seen, and there is little to no detail. And we are not even given the courtesy, the courtesy of being able to consider this bill. But colleagues, it actually gets even more ironic because Senator Gallagher said we have worked with industry. Well, can I tell you, if you have worked with industry, then you have a major problem. Because this is what industry says, those who know the experts about this piece of disastrous legislation. It is the single worst piece of energy policy seen anywhere, colleagues, in the world in almost 20 years. That's what industry says about this bill. The government's proposed gas market legislation risks the very foundations, the very foundations of the East Coast energy grid and all the news and Senator Scar. Seriously. That is the Australian taxpayer. That is, mum and dad's out there. That is Australians who use the energy market and you are about to decimate it. But it gets worse. So much for so much for working with industry because they also say this colleague the damage has already started. Bowen's blackouts are on the way. Nearly all gas contracting has uh, shrivelled up Cash. in the last few Senator days. Senator Cash, please resume your seat. Senator Polly. Uh, just in terms of point of order, that all comments should go through the chair, and it would be helpful if the uh, if the senator was to use people from the other place their correct titles. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Polly. Um, order. Order. The interjections that are being made are very loud and so loud that it is very difficult to hear Senator Cash. Please continue, Senator Cash. I'd be delighted to use the Prime Minister's title properly because guess what the Prime Minister this morning said in the House of Representatives, Collins, when he spoke to this? He said, this is the government's plan for energy price release. You've got to be kidding me. But he can't even mention the words $275, which you said 97 times, 97 times before the election. But you cannot bring yourselves now to mention the word 275. But also, let's see in committee stage which one of you, Senator Gallagher, I believe it's going to be you, is going to go through buried in the announcement of this bill is that energy prices are now forecast by the government to increase by an extra 6 per cent in 23-24. And it gets worse because, accordingly, on the government's own modelling, bills will still increase by $407 in 2023-24 and a cumulative $702 across the next two financial years. So guess what? That is in your own legislation. But the reason you're gagging it is you don't want to talk about it. This is a complete affront to the processes in the Senate and, quite frankly, going forward, the failure of the energy market will be on your head. Thank you, uh, Senator um, Cash. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, I rise to speak to this suspension today. The Australian Greens will be supporting this hour's motion. We think it is absolutely important that this place does its job. And the sheer hypocrisy of this mob on this side complaining about process complaining about integrity, complaining, I tell you what, that you have to rock up to work and do something. Because when was it? When was it? It was only a few years ago when at this exact time, rather than being Senator here while Hatton the country Young. burnt, the Prime Minister Senator was off having Young a bloody holiday. Senator Hanson Young, resume your seat. Thank you. Senator McKenzie. Uh, on a point of order. Order. It's so important. I'm, I'm very, very happy uh, to stay as long as Senator, Senator Hanson Young Senator would McKenzie, like. Senator McKenzie, what's the point of order? Well, to be honest, I didn't really have one. <laughs> uh, Senator Hanson Young, I have not called you back to your feet. Order. Senator McGrath, seriously, 
Your interjections particularly have been incredibly disorderly and disrespectful. You have constantly called out when I've called the Senate to order. I can barely hear Senator Hanson Young, particularly because of the interjection. She has the right to be heard in silence, and that's what I'm asking senators to do. Senator Colbeck, it is not okay to speak out when I'm calling the Senate to order. Senator Hanson Young, please continue. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, President. Well, only a few years ago, at this exact time, rather than pulling the country together, we of course know the former Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, oh, was off having a Senator holiday McGrath. instead of working. Instead of working. And here we are, we've been asked today to come back and to pass an important piece of legislation that relieves pressure for everyday Australians. And this mob over here want to complain, want to complain. They're squawking, they're squawking Senator like Hanson seagulls Young, over please here. Please resume your seat, uh, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, point of order, President. I really cannot hear Senator Hanson Thank Young's you. contribution. And who would, over the opposition, who would have thought a policy uh, vacuum Senator could Sh be Shoebridge, so loud? Senator Shoebridge, make your point of who order. Who would have thought? I will call senators once again to listen in respectful silence. Senator Hanson Young. The irony from the opposition over here to squawk like seagulls about process, about integrity, about the honour of the parliament when the bloke who couldn't hold a hose decided secretly to nominate himself as minister after minister after minister. So let's actually come back to the point of what we are here to do today. We are here to relieve the pressure on everyday Australians because power bills are rising, because cost of living is rising, because Order. the big companies, the big coal and the big gas corporations, have been ripping Australians off for years. Greed, greed, greed. And here we are trying to do something about it. We're trying to make sure that everyday Australians can actually start to get an idea of what this government can do to help relieve the pressure, to put in place a plan to bring down power bills and to bring down pollution while we're at it. The big corporations, the big gas and the big coal corporations, they're crying poor. I know why the opposition are squawking like seagulls, because they're doing the mouth work. They're the mouthpieces of the big coal and the big gas companies. And what are we hearing from them? Oh, it's all too hard. It's all too hard. Well, cry me a river. These are the very corporations who have been profiteering off the pain of everyday Australians, profiteering, may I say, off the bloodshed of a war in Ukraine, an illegal war. That is what these companies have been doing. And rather than standing up for everyday people, you've got this mob in here crying poor and squawking. And when are these companies going to be held to account? Because for a decade, for a decade, the opposition, the Liberal and the National Party, under various leadership, could do nothing to rein them in, nothing Senator to put McGrath. in place a plan to reduce pollution and to reduce power bills. Everyday people in this country know that the cheapest and the cleanest form of power is renewables, and they want the government to get on and help them, which is why we have worked hard to negotiate to get some outcomes on this bill. It's not perfect. Of course it's not perfect. This is all about negotiation and compromise, and we will keep the government's feet to the fire. Because you know what really should be going on? These big corporations should be paying their fair share of tax. There should be a windfall tax on them. Because greed, 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 off the back of people's misery is their mode of operandi, and it's time that came to an end. And today we have the uh, nail— Senator Hanson one... Young, please resume your seat. Order. Order. Senator McKim, I've got a senator on his feet. Senator Canavan. Just a point on relevance, uh, Madam President. Uh, this motion is about the hours of business today, and I know Senator Hanson Young is losing her cool here, but uh, she's starting senator, to talk about issues that have nothing senator to do Canavan. with the legislation that's before us today or this motion. It's completely irrelevant. 
Uh, please continue, Senator Hanson. Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Well, the biggest drill for the gas and the coal industry in this place, of course, is uh, Senator Canavan over here. No wonder he's squawking. No wonder he's squawking because his mates in the coal industry are saying, "You've got to stand up for us because we might be, we, may, we might have to pay less. We might, we might make less money. We might actually be held to account for once." That's what's going on. That is what's going on. There is no bigger supporter for coal and the, and the greed of the coal industry than Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Madam uh, President. And I too rise to uh, speak against this motion. We all come to this place to represent people, places, um, causes, and and that we are going to be debating today a piece of legislation that will have the most significant impact on our economy over decades to come in recent times, since wartime, and what the government has chosen to do is shut down the proper and rightful role of the Australian Senate in this debate. Yes. Now, we know where the numbers are. That was all pretty clear if you're reading all the newspapers over this week. You know what? You don't need to stress. It's going to pass. The Greens, Labor, Pocock coalition, you're going to get your legislation. But what you should not be doing is restricting the ability of us as a Senate and each of us as individual senators to have our say, to put on the record the views of our constituents, the views of our communities and the views of the wider Australian public. Well, you know, you know, Senator, what I'll take that interjection, and I'll take that interjection because you know what, industry doesn't know what to make because you have not consulted with them on how to actually uh, make this legislation. And for the National Party here today, I know, I know that the senators in our team, Senator Davey from New South Wales, Senator Price from the Northern Territory, Senator Canavan from the Great Resource State of Queensland and Senator Cadell from the heart of the Hunter Valley have very strong views on the resource sector and others. And they are not going to be able to contribute to this debate because the Labor Party, the executive government and their mates, the Greens, their coalition partners, the Greens, have effectively gagged rural and regional Australians and senators in this place from having their rightful opportunity to have a commentary. It is not on. We in the National Party represent the most vulnerable communities who are impacted by higher energy prices. We also are the communities that uh, contain our fabulous resource industry. And men and women in our communities have great jobs as a result of the resource industry that has been demonised by the dirty deal done by Adam Bant and Anthony Albanese and David Pocock to absolutely demonise the gas and the coal industry and take us to some nirvana that does not exist yet. And you don't need to look very far to see the impact of energy policy that doesn't get the baseload uh, generation in place to transition to renewables fast enough. It's not there, and it's not just me saying it. It's the experts. It's the experts. Now, we tried to get this legislation to be examined prior to today so we could ask some genuine questions of the government and the department about how it's going to work, what are going to be the unintended consequences. The it's actually our job. And both the Greens and the Labor Party refused to allow a couple of hours of examination of this legislation and scrutiny through the Select Committee of Cost of Living. Absolutely outrageous. Well, you know what? The only reason you're lock knocking back scrutiny is because you do have something to hide. Right. Yeah. Because you do have something to hide. Now, it's, it's, interesting. it's interesting to see. There could be another reason. The fact that we had two name changes to the legislation on our Reds yesterday yeah. within a couple of hours shows they hadn't even finished writing it. Um, the fact that the, the shadow minister didn't get the legislation until, I think, 8.45. Last night, last night, and in less than 16 hours, we're ramming it through. 
because we can. It is an absolute disrespect to our parliament. It is a disrespect to the men and women who sent us all here to do our job. You're going to get the outcome you want. This is the thing. You're going to get it passed. The number, the deal's done. What you should have been able to do is not gag senators and the Australian Senate from doing our rightful role. And we are very happy, Senator Hanson Young, to sit as long as it takes for every senator, and I note your party stacking out the speakers' list quite quickly, to have every senator have their say and every question rightfully asked thank of the you, minister. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Yeah. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, President. Well, this parliament has a big job to do today because the opportunity today is to debate the legislation that will underpin the government's energy price relief plan. Yeah. And I don't know whether there Order. are some. I don't know who needs to hear it in this chamber, but we have a serious challenge ahead of us. The illegal invasion of Ukraine has produced a global energy crisis, a global energy crisis the like of which we haven't seen for 50 years. Now it may suit it may suit others to ignore that, to pretend, President, that that is not the case. But actually, it's a pretty significant global event, and we're not immune Senator to the Canavan. consequences of those events. And it's for that reason that we've been working in a methodical way through the issues that it presents to Australian households, and particularly for Australian manufacturers, who, if any of you had been listening, have been pointing out this problem to us and to you and asking for a response. Asking for a response. Now, of course, the Liberals and the Nationals' engagement Order. with this issue is entirely disappointing, but entirely predictable, because actually they had 10 years, 10 years to come up with an energy policy, 10 years to grapple with the very significant technological changes and economic changes that were confronting our energy sector. And what did they do with their 10 years? Well, they certainly didn't land an energy policy. They certainly didn't land an energy policy at any point in that period. They did two things. These people, these people have never seen, never seen an issue that they weren't willing to politicise, to wield in terms of partisan point making. There is no issue. There is no issue that they're not willing to use for narrow partisan advantage. And every time, every time over the last decade and every time in this new parliament that the opportunity has presented to act in the national interest, they have chosen not to do so. Exactly. They have chosen petty, narrow electoral interest, whipping up fear, picking fights instead of solving problems. That's right. Instead of solving problems. And the opportunity is here today to solve some problems, to engage with the debate. We could be debating it now. We could have started mm, some 30 minutes ago. That's right. But we haven't done so. We haven't done so because you have chosen to debate, to debate the process instead of to debate the issues. We say let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Because what's required here is actually a sensible debate about the issues that confront us. What is required here is a sensible debate about the issues that confront us. Now, you can choose to deal yourselves out of that debate. You can choose to proceed in the way that you have so far by refusing to engage, by denying that issues exist, by hiding the presence of issues from the public, as your minister did prior to the last election, yep. hiding the increase to power prices. Yep. It's not this government's approach. This is a government that's actually willing to work with state and territory premiers and chief ministers. It's a government that's actually been willing to convene meetings of the energy ministers five times, five times since the election. What did Minister Keane say? Liberal Minister from New South Wales. What did the Liberal Minister say about that? He observed that it was pretty novel and they achieved more in that first meeting than they had in the previous four years. And you know why? It's because the approach taken by this government 
is one that actually seeks to solve public policy problems yeah. rather than to pick fights to occupy media space. And it's a different approach. I accept that. It's a different approach to the one that you all adopted when you were last in government. But it's an approach that is actually designed to operate yeah. in the national interest right. rather than in partisan interest. So you have a choice today, and President, everyone in this chamber has a choice today. You can vote for price relief. You can vote for a set of arrangements. You can vote for a set of arrangements that will achieve an orderly market, or you can obstruct. And all the evidence Thank so you, far Senator is that you will continue your time to has obstruct. Expired. Senator Roberts. President, one nation will be opposing the government on this motion, procedural motion, because we believe in the need for security and scrutiny. Energy primacy is fundamental to a modern society. In the last 170 years since the Industrial Revolution really started moving, energy prices did one thing relentlessly, ever decreased, ever decreased real energy prices. That enabled dramatic improvements in standard of living. Since 1996, we have artificially increased in this country energy prices and that have reversed human progress. Australia has a competitive advantage in Thank wonderful you, coal Robert, and gas. Thank you, Senator time for debate on this um, um, standing order has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher that we suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the eyes and Senator Askew as teller for the nose. Order. There being 27 ayes and 24 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I will now call Senator Gallagher. Immediately and without debate, can I, Ms. Fitt? <laughs> Thank you, President. Um, I move that a motion relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business may be moved immediately. Uh, so uh, the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Thank you, President. I move the motion as circulated. Thank you. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I seek leave to move an amendment to the government's routine of business as circulated in the chamber. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. Given the time, I won't speak to the amendment and I will merely move the amendment. Thank you, Senator Cash. So the question is the amendment as moved and circulated by Senator Cash to the hours motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Ayes have it. have it. Ring the bells for one minute. Thank you. Order, lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Cash to amend the hours motion be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being 24 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now intend to put the motion. I'll just allow Minister Gallagher to get back to her spot. And Senator Cash. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Noes have it. Ring the bells for one minute. Order. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 27 ayes and 24 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment Energy Price Relief Plan Bill 2022 for concurrence. I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is: the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 and for other purposes. I call the minister. Uh, thank you, President. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Minister. And I'm calling Senator Dunningham. Well, and may I commence by wishing you a happy birthday <laughs> for you. today. But look, today is not a day for celebrations. It is not a happy day for Australians. Because I tell you one thing, uh, colleagues: Australians are struggling, and we all know it. It's what we intend to do about it that is important. And what we're doing here today in this legislation, which has been rushed together, mixed up in a little room out the back of some ministerial office, is not going to address that issue. Let's consider what we saw in the months leading up to the election. A repetition of a particular number. 275 was the number 
and it was repeated Senator Cash, 97 times in the lead up to the election. That repetition makes me think, Acting Deputy President, it was a pretty important thing for the opposition, then opposition, now government, to have spoken about. Because that number, 275, was a promise that the Labor Party made to the people of Australia in order to get, to get their votes to win government. In fact, given they won the election, I would see that as a contract between the government and the people of Australia that voted for them on that basis. People rightly believed the Labor Party when they said, we will reduce your power bills by $275. 97 times, as Senator Cash pointed out earlier on, was that number repeated. But since the election was held, since the ministry was sworn in, since the Prime Minister moved into the lodge and has spent a lot of time talking to his international counterparts, they have not once said that number. Not once. Not one minister. Not one backbencher. Not in the other place, not here, has a single Labor member of parliament referenced that number, $275. So we're left thinking, why? And I'll tell you why, because it's a broken promise. They told Australians they would reduce power bills by $275. Clear. No terms and conditions. No, read the fine print. It was as clear as day for every single Australian every time the Prime Minister said it. 97 times, this is what will happen if you vote for us, and so accordingly they did. And they expect this reduction in power bills. And in fact, it's important to point out, because you often hear the now government say, oh, things have changed since we made those promises. The war in Ukraine, a terrible event, something we all condemn and wish would end for the sake of those people who are being so tormented by this, whose lives are being destroyed. But the Labor Party they made that commitment a further 27 times since the commencement of that conflict. So you can't hide behind that as a reason not to deliver on a promise. And not only is it a broken promise, we've gone in the other direction. What is actually happening here when it comes to Australian power prices? The budget said it all that electricity would be skyrocketing by 56 per cent. Electricity prices, household budgets, something we all have to try and deal with, are going to go up by 56 per cent. The government's own budget spells that out clearly. Gas prices going up by 44 per cent. And here we are, six months on from the election, the election at which that promise I've already referenced a couple of times was made, and there is no plan. There's been no plan. But what we have got now is a hastily cobbled together piece of legislation which will not do what the government says it will, will not deliver power price relief for Australians in the way that they suggest it will, will not, most importantly, will not deliver on their election commitment. There is no way that that promise they made just a few short months ago, so clearly, so often, of $275 being delivered at all. But I say, this has been cobbled together in the worst of ways, and I wonder what process has been gone through to develop this legislation. What were they thinking? Who were they talking to? What was the end outcome they wanted? Was it all about optics? Was it about the stunt of recalling parliament to try and mislead Australians into thinking that all of their energy price woes were going to be resolved by this bill? Was it about that? Or was it about genuinely helping Australians? The fact is, this bill, so hastily put together, we as an opposition only received at roughly 8.45 p.m. yesterday. Not even 12 hours, really, between when the opposition received the bill and when debate commenced in the other place. 12 hours is not a great deal of time to consider some of the most extreme interventions in the energy market we've seen in decades. And I honestly can't understand what they were thinking. And it's a couple of points that have been made uh, with regard to process already. And I was listening to uh, Senator Cash's contribution before, quite timely, about how important the role of this parliament is. And indeed, in the other place, the manager of, uh, then uh, manager of opposition business, now leader of the House, Mr Burke, made very similar points in relation to this, saying there's a process that happens with legislation and that I have to say it does matter. It does matter that members have the opportunity to read legislation. Well, unless colleagues were staying up all night 
to then be able to convene as a Senate today to rush this piece of legislation through, not give it due regard, due interrogation, due scrutiny, then that process that was so important in opposition now apparently doesn't matter at all. And Senator Cash had it right, because what we're seeing is we're seeing a government, this brave new world of the Labor Party, talked a lot about transparency before the election and scrutiny and the role of parliament in partnership with the Greens, now expecting this chamber just to rubber stamp things on false debates. And as I say, you know, if there's nothing to hide, if there's nothing to worry about, I'm not sure why we're finishing the debate at 4.30 today, why we couldn't go just a little bit longer and allow those colleagues of mine that did want to make second reading contributions and put perspectives from the communities they represent on record. Why wasn't that allowed to happen? Anyway, here we are, a costly recall of the parliament to uh, pass this bill which has so shambolically been put together, which will not achieve uh, the intended aims that the government says exist with this legislation. And we also have a deal that's been done with the Australian Greens, which we're not going to be able to actually get the details of before we vote on this legislation. Again, where's the transparency? What's to hide? Perhaps we will hear some details about exactly what will happen in the next budget that has been agreed to here by the Australian Greens. And of course, uh, to that end, I can indicate that there will be an amendment on that particular issue moved by myself. But I will make the point as well, of course, that uh, we do support targeted relief for Australian households and Australian businesses. Relief from cost of living increases that actually works, that will deliver reductions in power bills, that will deliver reductions in the cost of fuel and food and all of the other essentials that households and businesses need. And uh, I'll foreshadow as well, of course, that we do have an amendment in the committee stage that goes to uh, separating out the part of the bill that uh, in the other place and other colleagues have indicated we would support in order to provide um, relief to Australian households and businesses, but not the other extreme interventionist components of this bill. This bill isn't targeted relief that will work. As I said before, they broke a promise about delivering a $275 power price increase quite blatantly. And as I said, and I will lay down the challenge now for the minister in her summing up speech to reference that figure. Let's see if there can at least be a reference to $275. Maybe we're on, you know, on the pathway to delivering that for Australian households. Or maybe, as I suspect, we won't ever hear those numbers pass the lips of a government minister in this government ever again. That promise was broken. And they're now promising that this bill, the one before us today, will bring down the cost of power. It won't do that. This bill will not do that. And we know it won't do that. This will be another broken promise. And the real test really here is this. When Australians, Australian households and businesses open up their next power bills, their next gas bill, let's see whether the prices have gone up or down from the last one. That's going to be the metric against which Australians will judge what this government has done. And it will be the metric against which the government will need to go and explain themselves to Australian people about the promise they made 97 times, clearly without equivocation, and then failed to deliver deliberately broke. That's the test. And as I said, it's not just going to be homes, it's also going to be businesses, it's going to be the job generators out there across regional Australia, downtown cities like Melbourne and Sydney, places where manufacturing occurs, energy intensive businesses who, when power prices go up, are going to rein in costs, they're going to sack people, we're going to see jobs going overseas where it's cheaper to do business. And and to purchase power to manufacture the goods we should be manufacturing here. And of course, if we're interested in looking after our environment, those emissions will be generated elsewhere. This is not going to help anyone. It won't help the economy. It won't help households. It won't help businesses. It will not bring down the cost of living. It will not even help the environment. Still here, we have higher power prices. And we have a government ignoring a very basic principle of economics, the laws of supply and demand the need to bring on supply, to reduce pressures on what we have already in place. And, I mean, we only have to look at 
the comments of people like the, the Reserve Bank Governor, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, any other energy market expert who have all made it very clear the answer to the energy crisis, which this bill purports to drive a silver bullet through, is supply, bringing more supply on. The lack of supply drives up prices, and it's a point that's been made before, and I think it's a very important one for Australians to understand. You can't switch off the old system without switching on the new, and we don't have a new. We cannot just, in the blink of an eye, replace what we need in terms of energy consumption. We cannot just switch across to some ethereal new energy generation source when we switch off coal and gas. But that's what this government is seeking to do, and the end result is going to be disastrous. It will be higher power prices, not lower ones. It won't be $275 off your power bill, as promised just six months ago. It will be something far in the opposite direction. And, as I said, you know, the Labor Party, all of their ministers, all of their backbenchers refuse to reference those numbers. And so I hope today, in passing this legislation, given they've stitched up the numbers of their secret deal with the Greens and others, that they will, that they will be able to reference $275 in what they say today. Are we on track to it? Is it still a promise? Is it still government policy? Let's see. And uh, while I, I take the minister's interjection a little bit earlier on. Uh, says the deal between the Greens and the Labor Party isn't secret. Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing the ins and outs, the details of exactly what has been agreed here. It's going to be very, very important in this debate. The big losers out of this, though, uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, of course, are going to be Australians. <coughs> Households already struggling to make ends meet and businesses becoming uncompetitive. And if I can just refer to a couple of the criticisms that have been levelled at this from people who actually know what they're talking about, even for those people who may not want to trust politicians and take them at their word. Let's go and listen to some of the comments that have been made. Uh, David Maxwell, the CEO of East Coast gas producer Cooper Energy, who said, and I quote, in my 30 plus years in management roles in the gas industry, I've never seen such destructive legislation. That was on the 11th of December this year. ExxonMobil slammed the move as reckless free market intervention and said the rushed and ill-considered policy would inevitably risk gas shortages. Credit, Swiss, uh, uh, Credit Suisse's Saul Kavanich said the damage has already started. Nearly all gas contracting has shrivelled up in the last few days. An energy market analyst, Mark Samter, said this is the single worst piece of energy policy I've seen anywhere in the world in almost 20 years at looking at global energy markets. Yep. Pretty damning pieces of uh, feedback there from people who seem to know what they're talking about. The sad thing is, though, the government just dismisses these criticisms as people clinging on to profits. Well, again, the real test in this is going to be whether what they do today brings down power prices. That's where it's going to be at, and that's what we need to be focusing on. You know, ignoring Economics 101 as they have, ignoring the laws of supply and demand. Um, Providing unprecedented, pow and unprecedented powers to the Australian energy uh, to control the Australian energy sector, delegating powers to the Treasurer to make broad-ranging regulations—all of these things we've had uh, just a handful of hours to consider. And by 4:30 today, it will have passed the Australian Parliament with the support of the Australian Greens, and Australian households, Australian businesses are all going to be worse off. And I repeat, the test that they need to pass is for power prices, the next time they're opened at your kitchen table, when you get home, they need to be lower. Yep. If they're lower, they've done the right thing. But I'm taking a bet here they won't be lower. They will be higher. This bill will not do what the government have said it will do, and the losers will be the Australian public, Australian businesses, this country as a whole. It is a broken promise again, just like the last Thank one. Thank you, Senator Dunham. Yeah. Uh, before we move on, Senator Dunningham, uh, do you want to move your motion on sheet 1793? I move the amendment, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Will I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment Energy Price Relief Plan Bill of 2022? And the fact that we're back here today, a week before Christmas, shows that it's finally becoming clear to this government that the cost of living crisis needs urgent attention. 
we know that people across Australia are doing it tough and that obviously this is often the time of year that people feel it the most. The cost of living just keeps rising, much faster than wages are rising. Rent, going to the doctor, putting food on the table, electricity bills, shoes for the kids, petrol, mortgage payments, everything is more expensive. The only ones not having a tough time are the big corporations and the fossil fuel sector. They are making record profits while ordinary people are struggling. Gas corporations like Santos and Woodside are making billions in profits and paying next to no tax. Coal exporters, have, uh, according to a report released this morning, have made a windfall gain last financial year of $45 billion. Fossil fuel companies have been profiting from the war in Ukraine and making record profits. Coal and gas companies are destroying farmland in Queensland, while farmers in the New Auckland mine have to fundraise to protect their water supplies. This problem has been created by the Liberal and Labor parties because they give too much special treatment to the coal and gas industry. It could be because of the promise of cushy post-parliament lobbying roles within the fossil fuel industry. Or maybe it's that the major parties have accepted $11 million in donations from the fossil fuel sector in the past decade. And uh, what do you know, every year over $10 billion in public money, subsidies for fossil fuels, is handed back to the coal and gas industry. It's a good return on investment for them, but it's a terrible deal for the rest of us and the planet. In the most recent budget, the Labor government gifted $1.9 billion of new money, public money, for gas in the Northern Territory. On top of continuing the nearly $40 billion of fossil fuel subsidies put in place by the former government, there are 113 fossil fuel projects in the pipeline that this government has refused to rule out. And despite the damage that it's causing to our household budgets, to our national budget and to our climate budget, there's efforts underway to expand more gas in my home state of Queensland. We see billionaire Gina Reinhart trying to get more gas out of Queensland. We see continuing threats to frack the sensitive Channel country, an area that the Queensland and Commonwealth governments have previously committed to protect. And we see this despite the clear opposition from First Nations owners and farmers. We do not need more gas. Gas is just as dirty as coal and its extraction risks our land and water. We need to stop the gas industry from ripping us off, disrespecting First Nations communities and mining and burning a product which is destroying the planet. So this bill is a first step towards the coal and gas corporations taking a much needed haircut. It will give powers to the minister to implement a 12-month price cap on the price of gas which the government has said they'll set at $12 a gigajoule. This will, in conjunction with the coal price caps to be implemented by New South Wales and Queensland, this will deliver approximately $230 per household in savings over the coming year. But sadly, this doesn't mean that people will pay less on their gas and power bills. Those bills are still going to increase. It will just increase by less than it would have without this piece of legislation. This bill also allows the government to provide $1.5 billion of funding, co-funded by uh, another $1.5 billion from the states and territories, to households and businesses to reduce power bills. Now, this is a start, but it's not enough. It's one sixteenth of the amount that the government just gave in stage three tax cuts to the rich in the recent budget. Those folk get $24 billion a year, <laughs> and ordinary people are only getting $1.5 billion. That's why I'll be moving a second reading amendment to raise the rate of income support so that people can be helped out of abject poverty and for a two-year freeze on power prices to the level they were before the war in Ukraine, funded by the big coal and gas polluters. That's what the Greens will continue to push for, even after this legislation passes, and it's what households deserve. Now, unfortunately, we couldn't get the government to agree to make coal and gas pay from their record profits with a windfall tax to help households. What we were able to get, uh, get the government to agree to is a support package in the next budget to help low-income households and renters and businesses get off gas and switch to high-quality electric appliances. That will lower power bills, it will reduce emissions and it will reduce health impacts. 
The government has agreed to work with the Greens to develop a significant package of measures to help households and businesses electrify their operations, improve their energy performance and cut energy bills as part of that 2023-24 budget process. <clears throat> This will help roll out electrification to businesses and households, and we'll be particularly looking to support those groups that have struggled to access the benefits of home electrification, like people on lower incomes, private renters, people in public and community housing, and folk in apartments. If we're going to transform this country to run on 100 per cent clean, green, renewable energy, which we need to do as soon as possible, we need a solution for everyone, not just those with the disposable income who can afford to upgrade their, upgrade their rooftop, their cars and their appliances to access the thousands of dollars of energy savings and the climate benefits. The Climate Council has looked at the financial benefit of electrifying homes, and it's estimated that a household can save between $500 and $1,900 a year by switching from gas appliances to electricity. And unlike the 230 that the government has modelled that will be saved by this 12-month only price cap, those savings will be permanent. They will be delivered year after year. And one extra dirty little secret that the gas industry excludes from its sales pitch is that gas in your home is hurting you and your family. Gas cooking in the home has been estimated to be responsible for up to 12 per cent of the burden of childhood asthma in this country. There are so many good reasons to get out of gas. Keeping gas in the ground and replacing it with renewables is the best way to secure real cost of living support, real action on climate and less health impacts for our kids. So, of course, the gas industry is having a meltdown and threatening to deny gas to the East Coast gas market. This is cartel-like behaviour, and it's further evidence of why a lot more government intervention in this market is urgently necessary. As part of our arrangement to pass this bill today, the Greens also secured a number of important guarantees. We've confirmed that the compensation to households will be wider in scope, will not be settled this year, and we will keep pushing for more help for more households. We've confirmed that this package does not contain any of the coal subsidies that have been spoken about in the media. And while my colleague Senator McKim will say more about this, let me be crystal clear. The Greens will never support any subsidies going to the coal and gas industries. And if the government brings future legislation to give effect to any coal or gas subsidies, we will oppose it. The coal and gas companies should be compensating the people, not the other way around. People in this country should not be held to ransom by the international gas corporations, and this bill is a start to protecting people from their bottomless greed. But there is a lot more to do. The Greens' demands are simple. No more coal and no more gas. No more public money for the coal or gas industry. Freeze power bills for two years um, at the rates they were before the illegal war in Ukraine, funded by making those massive corporations pay their fair share of tax while we transition off those dirty industries to clean, affordable, renewable energy that is job-rich. So it's good that Labor has taken a first step to stand up to these powerful interests. And on top of the 12-month price cap, the bill gives the ministers powers to introduce a mandatory code of conduct for the gas industry. This will allow the government to begin taking back the reins on who controls our energy markets from the big gas corporations. But it will take courage to tackle those special interests, and we will keep pushing the government to do so. Banning political donations from the fossil fuel industries would also break the chains and allow Parliament to stand up for the community, not the vested interests of big corporations and political donors. With the Greens, Labor has the numbers to stop new coal and gas, to make them pay their fair share of tax and to end the public subsidies. Or Labor can choose to run scared of the power of the gas industry and their threatened advertising campaigns. But the powers, with the powers in this bill, the government will now face a choice, and we'll keep pushing them to, uh, to make the right one. Uh, we'll be moving a series of amendments to give effect to some of the points that I've made, and I foreshadow um, the second reading uh, standing in my name. And I'll just conclude by saying we are in a cost of living crisis. We need to bring people's power bills down, and we need to speed up the transition to clean, green, renewable energy. But we think the coal and gas companies should be paying for that transition and for those subsidies out of the record profits that they have made off the back of the misery of the people in the Ukraine. And we are deeply disappointed that the government would not come at taking on the coal and gas corporations and making them pay their fair share of tax. 
but we will be supporting uh, this payment as a slight uh, relief for folk, and we will keep pushing for broader cost of living relief, uh, not just in the climate context, but in all things, whether it be access to mental health care support, dental health care, housing, you name it. Government should be delivering for the people, not just for the big companies and the fossil fuel industry that's tried to run this place for so long. Senator McDonald. Thank you. Well, today we are faced with an unpalatable, unpalatable fact. Either Labor doesn't know the consequence of this legislation and are incompetent, or they do. And this is the most malicious piece of legislation that will see gas shortages, it will increase electricity prices and it will drive up unemployment. Be very clear, this is an attack on the resources sector, a sector that currently, through royalties, through taxes and investment, is the backbone of our economic strength. It pays for our health system. It pays for much of our education system and much of our roads and infrastructure. And so much of what we're going to hear today from the other side completely misunderstands the structure of the Australian economy. And if Australians knew what Labor and the Greens are passing today, if they knew what the future holds for them in the very near future, they would rightly be devastated because this legislation is selling out their future. This is one of the largest and most significant government interventions that we have seen in the market for decades. And the Albanese Labor government is too arrogant, too deceitful to allow proper consultation. It was still in the oven being baked last night and it's come out completely uncooked. And history has shown time and time again that price caps will only result in supply shortages and that leads to price rises. This is economics 101 and Australians need to brace for blackouts, higher prices, investment uncertainty in the months to come. This is panicked policy on the run. It's full of loopholes, unintended consequences. It raises more questions than it answers. It provides more certainty. And I'll be asking questions on this today, as I will before debate and discussion is gagged. It certainly won't, won't deliver the $275 electricity cut that was promised 97 times by the Prime Minister. It will actually still mean that electricity prices will increase by 23 per cent. It will lead to energy rationing and blackouts. And manufacturing jobs that Labor will continue to tell you how important they are to them, they will not be about saving manufacturing jobs. This legislation will undermine those jobs. This is a disgraceful betrayal of all Australians. This legislation is a policy failure, despite nine years in opposition, six months of the government to develop this policy proposal that they keep saying should have been made. Instead, a week before Christmas, the PM announces a policy. Six days later, here we are, considering legislation that the ink is still wet on. A treasurer who's never run a business, but now he wants to run the entire Australian gas industry. And through his comments this morning, we see again how little the Treasurer understands his own legislation in this place. It reaches far beyond a 12-month price cap. It creates a permanent cap on rates of return. This is a diabolical deal between the Greens and Labor. And this massive overreach gives the government power to set the price and force companies to provide or not provide gas supply. And it allows the Treasurer the power to decide who gets gas in this new gas shortfall environment. Energy experts have already been quoted as saying that this is the single worst piece of energy policy in the world in the last 20 years. 
after, after almost 20 years looking at global energy markets despite staunch competition from many other dreadful policies around the world. That's not a competition that we want to win. The damage has already started. Nearly all gas contracting has shrivelled up in the last few days. This unprecedented market intervention announced risks driving investment out of the system. This is the part that the Greens and Labor do not understand the incredibly competitive environment that we live in for investment dollars. Now, the Prime Minister has had a lot to say before the election on about how, in his government, we will do things differently. And as recently as March was saying, I want proper process, I want to consult people. And yet we are seeing legislation that the Greens and the crossbench agreed to support before they'd even seen the words on the page. The unintended consequence that will arrive from passing this legislation with haste are deeply concerning, and I guarantee you we will be back to make amendments. I mentioned that it de this bill will delegate power to the Treasurer to make broad-ranging regulation to control pricing, contracting, purchasing activities in the gas market. It reaches far beyond a 12-month price cap. Such market intervention will result in a permanent cap on rates of return, something that even the worst tin-pot autocrats haven't imposed on their upstream resources sectors for fear of strangling investment and supply. And in Europe currently, guess whose jobs we're seeing are going? It's manufacturing jobs. Because there is not a treasurer in the land who will choose to supply gas to manufacturers over households to cook and heat and live their lives. So to all the manufacturing companies who are greeting this legislation with joy, be very, very afraid, because you will not be the top of the Treasurer's Christmas list when it comes to allocating gas. We know that the answer to reducing the cost of energy, the cost of gas, is more supply. We are a nation blessed with resources, and the arrangement that this nation has with investors, both domestically and abroad, is that the investors take the risk. They provide the capital, the risk, the workforce, the planning approvals to access our resources. And in return, they pay royalties, they pay company taxes, they pay PAYG taxes, and they invest in operational capital investments that flow to small Australian businesses. Businesses in my part of the world, regional Australia. This rush legislation will end up with uh, Hot loopholes that provide no clear solution to this crisis. Uh, the mandatory code of conduct does not include retailers. Normally, the Greens would want to know what these gaps are. They would be keen to make sure that they are part of passing reasonable and good legislation. But they have instead allowed this to be rushed through uh, with, with unintended consequences that we will all regret. This breach of faith of bringing legislation to the House and then the Senate with absolutely no oversight is not new. The gas companies earlier this year were asked to, to join a heads of agreement to provide what was expected to be a supply shortfall to the market. They did that—157 petajoules of gas was agreed to be supplied to the market, but now, only a few months later, uh, they are being demonised and, uh, and another breach of faith for important investors in our economy. We know that Ministers Bowen and Husick have no desire to support a gas industry. Minister Bowen called a gas-led recovery BS. Husick called producers greedy. The Greens and Teals don't want cheaper gas. We've already heard they hate gas. But their support of this policy will increase prices and hurt the very people who they proclaim to want to assist. They have no understanding of reality. The competition uh, for investment that we are under 
and the huge amounts of taxes that are paid in this nation. There is no industry support for this legislation. Labor has ignored all expert advice. Regional towns like Roma and Miles, who have prospered during, due to gas industry, the agricultural people in that region who have prospered due to more jobs and support to stay on their farms, those regional jobs are threatened. Family businesses are at risk. Labor does not care about these communities. They're looking for a headline, not good policy. This is cheap politics from some backroom boys, and it is not about the future. We are an export nation. We, reply, we rely on investment from super funds, from offshore, to make the most of our extraordinary assets. And this legislation has run an icy finger down the spine for every project in this country, every well-paid job, every GST and tax dollar that currently goes to supporting health and education and infrastructure in this nation. We support household relief. We ask to split this bill to allow for that part to be passed singularly. But Labor voted that down because they are more, more interested in playing politics than in good policy. Now, Labor's modelling shows that uh, electricity prices will go up next year—23 per cent. There will be no reduction of $275, as promised, 97 times. And the retailers, which will not be included in the mandatory code of conduct, can still game the market, the spot market, with high prices. Credit Suisse has warned gas price fixing will increase the risk of blackouts as early as 2023. Energy Quest warning of 19 years of supply is now stranded, and price caps have been proven to lead to shortfalls. The lack of investment, the lack of exploration and development, a lack of supply. A shrinking supply will mean blackouts, will mean gas rationing, will mean higher demand and higher prices. Now, we've heard several times about this all being the fault of the war in Ukraine. This is an absolutely outrageous conclusion to draw. Our energy market and the European energy market are literally thousands of miles apart. The root cause of the energy crisis in Australia is the lack of renewable energy sources, reliable energy sources, the low renewable energy uh, generation, and the lack of baseload power. And we saw last winter the spike in prices when coal-fired power stations, which had not been able to be maintained during COVID, and which, let's be frank, had received clear signals from Labor about their lack of support, had to go into maintenance. Next year, we expect Liddell coal station, coal-fired power station, to go offline. What do we think is going to happen then? You might also be interested to know, the Greens, that the international spot price is today $50. The Wallenbiller price is $13.90. We are not linked markets. You have to stop repeating that lie. We know that price caps, price fixing and market intervention continually fail. Argentina and the United States both attempted this. Both ended up with greater reliance on overseas supply, higher prices and finally had to incentivise uh, uh, energy providers, uh, resource companies, to come back to the market. Labor is at war with the resources sector. It is plummeting investment confidence due to the, the layering of legislation that's been brought before this House, the damaging industrial relations legislation, the EPBC projects that have been called in, the 44 gas projects being reviewed under NOPSEMA, the $10 million funding for the EDO, the new EPA. These are all things that lead to greater investment uncertainty. So Labor is promising that the lights will stay on that the electricity prices will go down and your job will be secure and better paid. They have promised 97 times that the power price would reduce by $275 for you. So, when the lights go out, when you can't turn the gas on, when bills go up, when your job comes under threat and unemployment rises, 
you know who to blame. These are the inevitable outcomes that Labor is not being honest with Australia about. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many varied and hard-working people in our Queensland community, I'm happy to travel back to Canberra for this session while recognising that due to yet another Labor, Greens, Teal, Coalition rushed bill, many senators cannot. I've submitted a document discovery today to find out exactly how much taxpayers' money is wasted on this disgusting spectacle. It would have been wise for the government to work out what we were returning for prior to recalling the Senate, instead of this chaos to get a bill ready at 9.30 p.m. last night, and I read it on the plane down. With no committee oversight, no public scrutiny, no industry scrutiny, a shocking bill rammed through courtesy of the ALP Greens and Teal Senator Pocock in a single day, in hours, in return for quid pro quos next year. There's a point where the process of this government uses to, to get Greens and Teal Senator Pocock's support that moves past what is proper into very questionable territory. Under this bill, the gas industry is being murdered for the financial benefit of rival industries, wind and solar, who are financial supporters of the Greens and Teal Senator Pocock. It should be clear by now, surely, the Albanese Labor government are not the ones running the country. In the Senate, the Greens, Labor, Teal, Pocock Alliance together run the government. Now, I'm sure the Treasury Laws Amendment, Energy Price Relief Plan Bill 2022, has been met with popping champagne corks from comrades on the Labor left. Soviet-style powers in the government's grasp right now. The government regulation will decree what gas can be sold, to whom it can be sold, for how much it can be sold, who can be refused permission to buy or sell, and who can be forced to buy or sell. The Greens and Teals can't wait to write those regulations. A frightening power grab from a desperate government without a clue how to solve the energy crisis it helped create and now worsens. What industry will be next? Don't be fooled with this talk about temporary price caps. This legislation includes a code of conduct with permanent price controls built in. How much will that ongoing cap be? This is done through legislative instrument. So whatever the cap is, the commissar, sorry, the minister, can change it at the stroke of a pen with no appeal mechanism. Make no mistake, if this bill is passed, those regulations will esca escalate in lockstep with the government's desperation to control runaway inf energy inflation caused from escalating power shortages. Under the Liberal national government, tens of billions of dollars in direct subsidies have been poured into unreliable wind and solar. These are incapable of supplying baseload power at any affordable price. Because the market was not, has not closed hydrocarbon power down as fast as climate bedwetters want, coal-fired power stations are now being threatened with closure using state government powers. This is what is known as financial, in finance circles as political risk. As the supply of electricity becomes more, less reliable, afternoon price spikes are becoming common and everyone's power bill goes up. There's a lesson here. Intervening in energy markets to push a political ideology has unintended consequences. With this legislation, Australia is preparing to take our place alongside the Weimar Republic, Yugoslavia, Hungary and Venezuela on the list of governments who ignored and, as a result, destroyed their economies. Venezuela, Venezuela should be a lesson for Australia. Socialist President Maduro spent his first term in 2012 spending every cent the government earned from oil exports. Windfall revenue was spent on programs that sounded good on social media, yet proved unsustainable. Australia is spending every cent we earn from coal, gas and mineral exports, just like Venezuela did. When the oil boom ended, Maduro started printing money to keep wasteful government spending going. Australia, over the past three years, printed $500 billion using electronic journal entries. Maduro's print and spend caused prices to double each week, and Maduro responded with price controls. Australia's inflation rate is at a 30-year high, nothing like Venezuela's, and yet we have price controls being introduced with this bill. Price controls cover up the problem. They never solve it. They make it worse. To take such an authoritarian measure is an indication that something has this government and the premiers spooked, likely the real inflation rate that will result from net zero measures. Time will tell. The way in which a Western country like Venezuela lost control of their economy should be a warning to Australia. For three years, print and spend measures have been waved around Liberal, Nationals, Greens, Labor, 
and now Teal's uni party voices. Labor did not inherit Scott Morrison's mess. Labor in the states were part of Scott Morrison's mess. Whether our inflation rate from this point moves forward, moves up or down is squarely in the government's hands. A small number of people in the government think that they are smarter than the free market, the collective will and ideas and hearts of millions of people. The same free market has for generations successfully combined hundreds of thousands of workers with hundreds of billions of dollars of capital equipment. In order to successfully manage trillions of dollars in mineral resources for the lowest cost to the customer. Now though, our federal and state Labor governments, together with the fake Christian, fake Conservative New South Wales government of Matt Keane and Dom Perrottet, think this piece of legislation will fix what they broke. Rubbish. So much hubris combined with so little knowledge of history and economics will be the downfall of our beautiful country. Venezuela, here we come. In six months, the Albanese government has steered Australia from welfare liberalism to socialism. Next port of call, next port of call will be statism before Labor reach their ultimate destination, communism. And we go back to feudalism. I notice some commentators have been calling for the government to penalty tax the very high profits being experienced in the mineral industry in recent years. Instead of making money for taxpayers, the Prime Minister decided instead to just destroy those profits so that shareholders don't get them, the taxman doesn't get them, nobody gets them, and the Australians and the taxpayers are paying $1.5 billion a year in borrowed subsidies from our debt finance budget. 1.5 billion years over two years, 1.5 billion dollars over two years is only 1% of the household and small business electricity market. This measure is more public relations than realistic assistance. One nation will not be wedged on this payment. Borrowing money from Australians to give back to Australians is a pointless exercise. It literally transfers money from children to their parents and responsible parents do not fall for this rubbish. It is a sugar hit that takes attention away from what, why electricity prices are so high. Rising electricity prices come from several different aspects of the government's net zero transition, which, for clarity, is a transition away from cheap and reliable coal based load power to fairy tale nature dependent solar and wind power. Treasury are projecting electricity prices will rise 36 per cent next year. If passed, this bill will reduce that rise by 6.5 per cent, and if the states cap the coal price, this will save another 6.5 per cent. In any event, electricity is still going up next year. Households can expect a rise of $420 using the government's own sums, a rise of 23 per cent, almost a quarter higher. When these measures fail, and they will, the rise will be $650. Today I submitted a motion for a document discovery on the modelling claiming the increase will be 23 per cent, not 36 per cent, including the element of any electricity price rise caused as a result of the Ukraine war. Now I look forward to seeing this modelling. The Treasury Laws Amendment Energy Price Relief Plan Bill 2022 does with gas, deals with gas only. The Albanese government has dumped the coal price ceiling on the, the states to avoid having to pay compensation. John Howard's government pulled that same bypass around the Constitution when he took property rights away from farmers to meet the UN Kyoto targets without paying a cent to, to compensation to farmers. The Albanese government has joined John Howard's government in destroying trust in government, with the result government must now apply more and more coercive measures to government. Australia's gas price has been a problem since the end of 2020. 2020. The government's Australian Energy Regulator, the government agency itself, confirms the rise in gas prices started more than a full year before Russia invaded Ukraine. Treasury and the government spin doctors blaming Russia for electricity price rises is dishonest. It is deceitful. Gas and coal price rises have resulted from the need to back up unreliable wind and solar with gas, combined with colder temperatures and a wind, and a wind drought across Western Europe. At the same time, the idiots in power in Western Europe closed their coal and, and nuclear plants. Gas became the only thing keeping the lights on. Dishonestly blaming Russia instead of the correct cause, net zero energy deficits will lead Australia down the same dishonest, inhuman path as Europe. This bill quite simply fixes the wrong problem. The war on coal has meant Australia cannot meet the world demand for coal, and as a result, prices are high. 
and market demand has switched, from, has switched to gas, whose prices are now going up. Australia has a coal and gas supply problem, not a price problem. Australia must take the jackboot off the coal and gas industries and allow more production. Rather than imposing old Soviet-style controls of the gas industry under this bill, the federal government could have gone with a much simpler and less onerous option. Western Australia has had a domestic gas reservation since 2006. This requires gas extractors to reserve 15 per cent of production for Australian domestic use. This scheme has produced a gas price around $5 a gigajoule, which is production cost plus a fair profit. Prime Minister Albanese could have used this system on a national level. He chose not to. Instead, the Prime Minister has gone with old Soviet-style legislation that will cost Australians twice as much for gas than a reservation system would have cost. Why would they do that unless the reason for the legislation is not the price cap and is instead this bill's industry control powers? In two or three years' time, the public will be marching on, old pa on Parliament House to protest electricity bills that are so out of control that power companies will be disconnecting people left, right and centre. Once the serious protests start, this government will reach for the permanent price controls in this bill to force coal and gas extractors to sell to electricity generators at next to nothing just to save themselves. There is a showdown coming in this place. This morning, Adam Bent confirmed that the Greens and Teals are committed to eliminating the gas industry. Hydrocarbons have lifted Australia and the world out of poverty. The Greens will cast our beautiful nation back to the dark ages. Gas is essential for firming solar and wind, which means gas and coal are the only things keeping our lights on, our fridges running and industry functioning, and electric vehicles running. Without gas and coal, the economy will be entirely reliant on nature-dependent solar and wind power and battery backups that carry a price tag above $100 billion and require renewal every 10 years. Green energy is no energy. Eliminating gas and coal is insanity. The Albanese government's proposal for a coal price cap will not reduce electricity bills and most certainly and likely will increase them. Coal plants buy coal on long-term supply contracts. The cost they are paying is not the spot price. It is much, much less. The cap of $125 a tonne is above, is above the current contract supply price currently being paid at coal-fired power stations in Australia of $80 to $100 a tonne. It is likely that suppliers will increase their supply price of coal to $125, knowing that's the safe limit. A coal price rise is the most likely outcome from these measures. A 6.5 per cent fall is technically impossible. Let me tell you why. For the sake of government argument, let's assume the price of coal in 2023 would have been $175 and is now $125 as a result of the cap. Let's have a quick look at the effect of that $50 a tonne reduction. The energy density of coal is high—6.7 kilowatt, kilowatt hours per kilo, which means one tonne of coal produces 6.7 megawatt hours of electricity. That's enough to run 1,600 homes in Queensland for a day. So a $50 saving divided by 1,600 homes, at the most simple level of analysis, this measure will save householders three cents a day on their electricity bills. Not six and a half, not six and a half percent, which is $110 a year, because coal fuel costs are a tiny portion of the coal-fired electricity price. The government's measures are being sold with a deceitful public relations spin, hiding onerous Soviet-style controls that are the real reason for this legislation. There's another serious risk to our energy security. This bill ignores rising interest rates, but I won't go into that in detail. There is an entirely better way. Even to the global warming believers, One Nation's plan can deliver cheap, stable baseload power without upsetting your sky god of warming. All we have to do is stop closing coal-fired power stations, build Collinsville Power Station and replace Liddell with modern heli power, transition Australia's coal generators to modern heli power, transitioning to clean coal and ending government handouts for renewable fairy tale solar and wind power will dramatically reduce electricity bills. It's time to walk away from this net zero dumpster fire. I call on the Senate to reject this bill and say no to Soviet level powers that will inevitably backfire and cause an economic and social catastrophe that will hurt the people. One Nation has been right to oppose net zero madness for 25 years. We will continue to be a voice of reason, bringing better solutions to this parliament. Solutions that will provide everyday Australians and the businesses 
we all rely on with opportunity and prosperity for all. We have one flag above this parliament. We are one community. We are one nation. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Cash. Thank you. And I do rise to make a contribution, albeit a very brief one, on the Treasury Laws Amendment Energy Price Relief Plan Bill 2022. Uh, given that the debate in total guillotines at 4.30, I will make my remarks incredibly short to ensure that we have some time in committee this afternoon. And I just want to address three issues. Uh, in the first instance, though, I do foreshadow that I will be moving a second reading amendment to refer Schedule 1 of the bill to the Economics Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 7th of February 2023. The first issue I want to address we saw this morning when the motion in relation to the routine of hours was moved. The absolute chaos in terms of the process that this bill has been through uh, to actually get to this place. In fact, if you even call it a process, but also the sham of the Senate sitting today for about three and a half hours. For anybody listening in, for those in the gallery who are interested to read more about this, I would refer you to an article in The Australian Today by Henry Urgus, an esteemed economist. Bill to set gas prices a power grab by stealth. The first three paragraphs should worry all Australians. Late last Friday, Treasury, setting what may well be a new record, gave interested parties all of two working days to comment on a 54-page draft bill that threatens to end upend gas industry investments worth billions of dollars. Compounding the disregard for good policy process, there was no sign of a regulation impact statement insert shame, quite frankly, there from myself assessing the proposed legislation's consequences or even of a ministerial exemption from the statutory requirement for a RIS to be issued. But if any legislation merits serious scrutiny, rather than rush through Parliament, it is this one, whose effects will weigh on Australia's economy for decades to come. To anybody listening in, Henry Urgus in The Australian today. It is an absolute disgrace that we have left now just over one and a half hours to interrogate this bill. The second issue I would like to address is in relation to the test. The test for the Albanese government is a very simple one in relation to this legislation. Will Australians' bills in the coming months and years go up or down? Because they have promised one thing and one thing alone energy bill relief. So that is the test. There is no other test. The next time, as Senator Dunningham so eloquently said, you open your energy bill, has Labor passed the test? Now, the bad news is this, and again, because we don't have a lot of time to scrutinise the bill, we won't be able to explore this in details. Despite the cost savings in this bill, and we support the cost savings, the bill itself will leave consumers worse off. Buried in the announcement of the bill is that energy prices are now forecast by the government to increase by an extra 6 per cent in the 2023-2024 years than they were at the time of the budget. They're going higher, in other words. In the budget, the forecast was 30 per cent. Treasury officials have confirmed that this is a revised forecast informed by the Australian Energy Regulator. What does that actually mean? In plain English, this is what it means. Your bill is still going up. The government's own modelling, this is their modelling, their modelling means it, your, bill, your bill will still increase by over $400 in 2023-24 and further a cumulative $702 over the next two financial years. You'd think, listening to those on the other side, there was a windfall today for Australians in relation to their energy prices, but their own modelling shows bills are still going up. The third issue I'd like to briefly address, Senator Gallagher in her speech said, you've consulted with industry. Well, the bad news is this. It is little wonder energy experts are actually calling this package the single worst 
piece of energy policy seen anywhere in the last 20 years. Very briefly, they also say the government's proposed gas market legislation risks the very foundations of the East Coast energy grid and all who use it. Even worse, they say this, the damage has already started, nearly all the gas contracting has shrivelled up in the last few days. This policy breaks the gas market design that has kept the lights on for decades. And they tell you it's going to work. I'd listen to the experts if it was me. The experts who are in this industry and who know the effect of this type of government intervention. Again, I said I would keep my comments brief. I end with this. Yet again, the test for the Albanese Labor government is a simple test in relation to this legislation. Will Australians' bills in the coming months and years, because this is not a one-off, will Australians' bills in the coming months and years go up or down? That is the test. There is no other test. Senator Cash. Senator McKim. Well, thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, there's a pattern emerging as economic inequality explodes, as the cost of living climbs, as the climate breaks down around us, and as our ecosystems crumble underneath us. We saw it when the pandemic hit and we are seeing it here today. Whenever the failures of laissez-faire capitalism become conspicuous, socialism starts to look pretty good, even to politicians who dare not speak its name. And here we find ourselves today. Parliament's been recalled because coal and gas companies are profiteering off the back of a war. And in a deregulated energy market with mostly privatised electricity suppliers, energy bills have gone through the roof. And we need to do something collectively, and the government is moving to cap wholesale, wholesale energy prices. But importantly, the government isn't planning to put a ceiling on power prices. That's not what this legislation does. And the Greens have been calling for a freeze on electricity bills, and we are providing the government with a mechanism to do this. Now, there's no limit in this legislation to the amount of money the government can allocate to help people pay their power bills. So if people have to pay even a single dollar more on their power bills than they currently do, it'll be on the government. And let's be clear also about emissions. The government is not doing what is needed if Australia is to help prevent the breakdown of our planet's climate. Under this government, sure, we agree. We're not going off the cliff as fast as we were under the previous government. But make no mistake, we are still going off the cliff. Because if instead, instead of taxing the coal and gas companies' super profits, and that is actually what the government should be doing, taxing these wartime super profits as in, and using that revenue to provide genuine cost of living relief, including by freezing people's power bills, the government is planning to give the coal companies even more public money. This is the upside-down world of climate and energy policy in Australia. The coal companies make record profits, electricity prices go berserk, the government then turns around and gives more money to coal companies to guarantee their mega profits. Now, these subsidies, importantly, do not form part of this legislation. And I want to be clear, the Greens do not, never have and never will support public money going to the big fossil fuel miners, producers and generators, and we will fight, as we always have, to prevent them from happening. What's also shameful and a massive missed opportunity is the government has yet again passed up the opportunity to fix the utterly 
broken petroleum resource rent tax, despite reaping mega profits on the back of a global boom, many global gas giants are forecasting they will not pay a single cent in the PRRT. This is what you get when fossil fuel companies take over the nation's parliament. Money talks and their millions of dollars in donations to the major parties talk very loudly. Make no mistake, the resources industry calls the tune in this place. So yes, we will be supporting this legislation, but we want to be very clear that even when it passes, there will be a long, long way to go to provide the cost of living relief that people who need it the most genuinely need. We have a long, long way to go before Australia is playing the global leadership role we have to play in addressing the breakdown of our climate, and we have a long, long way to go before we have a parliament that is free from the stranglehold of the resources industry. I do have some questions for uh, the minister. I hope she's able to, res to, uh, to respond to these questions either in her second reading or in the committee stages, but I'll just place them on the record um, now. Firstly, will the reduction in the wholesale power price mean that some renewable energy producers' revenue will be lower than it otherwise would have been? And has any modelling been done on the quantum of any such reduction? What is the estimated cost to the Commonwealth of the planned subsidy to coal mine operators and coal-fired electricity producers? Are there any limits on the rate per tonne of this subsidy or on the total amount of the subsidy? And will the Commonwealth fund this subsidy or these subsidies out of an existing appropriation or will it require a supplementary appropriation? And uh, finally, in the interests of moving along, um, uh, Acting Deputy President, I do move the second reading amendment on sheet 1792 that has been circulated in my name, which calls on this Senate to reject all new fossil fuel subsidies. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, this is just another con by the Labor Party. Today, the Labor Party, with their stablemates, the Greens, are intending to legislate a lie. This bill will not see power prices going down. We know that power prices are only going to go up. Those opposite know that power prices are going up, but they're still prepared to mislead Australians. I mean, the opposition has always said we would not stand in the way of constructive, sensible cost of living relief to Australians, but this bill does not deliver that. So today we're going to see this bill shoved through this place because those opposite simply do not know the answers to the questions that they would have been asked had we been able to have an appropriate length of time to prosecute all of the very substantial issues that sit behind this bill. So instead of being coming in here and answering questions about who's going to be eligible for the payments, how much will they be eligible for, what will small business be able to get access to, who's going to miss out when supply is a demand exceeds supply, you know, whose power is going to be cut off, where's the modelling to show that energy prices are actually going to go down. Clearly there isn't any because we know they're going up. But most importantly, we would like to know from the government opposite and their colleagues, the Greens, what are you going to say to the Australian public when your disastrous interventions into the gas market mean the prices go up and Australians' power bills go up at the same time? But most concerningly, what are you going to say to Australians when the lights go out? So the contempt for this parliament by those opposite like, didn't get the legislation in its final form until 8.45 last night. How on earth is anybody supposed to prosecute the details of legislation in that time frame? We've had six months that we could have had that, that they've had to be able to do, deliver an, an energy policy, and what they've done at the 11th hour recalled the parliament at great expense to the taxpayers, including you know flying people in from overseas. I'd like to know who's footing the bill for flying those of their colleagues that are overseas. Yeah, and well, carbon offsets as well. But the reality is the complete contempt in this place by those opposite for the institutions of this government are unbelievably eye-watering. But 
Today, um, I also draw the attention to the chamber that this is a pattern of behaviour that we have been seeing from those opposite in much of the stuff that they've put through here. It's all announcement and no substance. We've seen legislative legislation after legislation pushed through this place with don't worry about the details, we'll show them to you later. Don't worry about the details, we've got it all covered. Well, once again today, we are having a bill pushed through here when there is absolutely no detail about something that potentially could have catastrophic effects for Australia and Australians. Absolutely catastrophic impacts. We know around the rest of the world that these sorts of interventions have never worked in the past. Why those opposite think they're going to work today is anybody's guess. They but they know they probably won't work. Well, actually, they know they definitely won't work, and that is why they're seeking to push this, this piece of legislation through without the appropriate scrutiny. So many on our side of the parliament would have loved to have had the opportunity to speak on this legislation, but in the interest of getting it into committee, so you actually have to answer some questions, albeit in a very truncated form, um, where they are not able to speak. But in, uh, in saying that this is a, a really dangerous and, uh, and concerning uh, habit that we're seeing from those opposite, uh, there is a, a second reading amendment that I'd like to foreshadow that I'm intending to move, Madam Acting Deputy President, in relation to the decision earlier in this week by the Minister for Health yeah. to slash Medicare subsidised mental health support for the most vulnerable Australians. You know, the government has prioritised pushing this piece of legislation through this place instead of prioritising the support for Australians who are battling with mental health. One would suggest the way things are going that they would prioritise their budget and their own ideological beliefs ahead of the mental health of Australians. And once again, in true Labor style, they are ignoring the advice of experts. Stakeholders like Dr Michael Greg Carr, who is actually calling on the Health Minister to resign, the Institute of Clinical Psychologists, Australian Psychological Society, Suicide Prevention Australia, the Australian Association of Psychologists and even their own backbench are saying this is a bad decision. So as we come into Christmas, when people, particularly lonely people, often find it toughest, with COVID still rampaging on our doorstep, cost of living going through the roof and this piece of legislation only going to make it worse. In my hometown in the Riverland, um, we are currently enduring uh, a creeping flood that is likely to impact seriously so many lives, livelihoods over this summer period, right at a time when Australians are needing the support of mental health supports that would be provided by these additional um, Medicare subsidised psychology sessions, they are ripping them out. And they're ripping them out even when the advice of their own report says that they should be kept in. So once again, um, we have seen a track record in legislation and policy development, but those opposite where no detail. Let's not worry about um, having any scrutiny on anything that we do. Do not care about the advice of the experts. Instead, they're just going to ram it through here and the consequences <coughs> of what they're doing. They'll worry about that later. Well, I can say that Australians will be worrying about the decisions that are going to be forced through this place today for many, many years to come. And I look forward to those opposite actually looking Australians in the face when their power bills go through the roof, when their power gets cut off, and they will actually have to accept the consequences of this disgusting legislation. Senator Babette. One of the most terrifying words in the English language. The most terrifying. I'll tell you, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. I'm here to help. Terrifying, as President Reagan once said. Now he could have easily been speaking about the Labor Party's the Labor Party's plan to cap energy prices, as well as all the other uh, increased regulations that they want to implement on the sector. This is a government solution almost guaranteed to make the very problem worse that it purports to solve, as was observed in the 60s and 70s with the fuel price caps. I don't know if uh, anyone recalls that. You're all a bit too young in here, but if you do, there you go. Now, the United Australia Party, of course, stands with consumers and business owners who are bearing the brunt of skyrocketing energy prices, and of course, we want to see prices come down. Now, we wholeheartedly support the $1.5 billion of temporary bill relief measures for those who need it, but we do not support 
the price caps or any increased regulations in the sector. Now, high energy prices are not simply the result of a war on the other side of this planet, like the Labor Party would have us believe. They are a product of self-inflicted, systematic deterioration of our energy sector over many, many years. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's hard to see, it's very hard to see, actually, how the Labor Party's naive market intervention will make any real-world difference whatsoever. Now, the government's proposal has already created enormous uncertainty in the market, as we all know. It will almost certainly cause energy investment to constrict, which will limit gas supply even further, making energy, sh energy shortages more likely to occur. And for what? For what exactly? Prices are still predicted to, to rise in the next two years by the government's own account by many, many hundreds of dollars. Now, the long-term solution, and there is a long-term solution, the long-term solution to higher power prices is not more government intervention in the market. That's ridiculous. It is not billions of dollars in tax subsidies or anything else. The long-term solution to high energy prices is greater supply. It's basic high school economics. I think I, I learned that in year eight. We must also get rid of red and green tape. Basic economics. Thank you, Senator Scar. And we must allow the private sector to produce. We don't need government intervention. We need less government intervention. The government, let's be honest, the government couldn't organise a beer in a brewery. That's what they couldn't do. Now, it's very clear what is happening here. The government is determined not to use the coal and gas we have, and the government is determined to stifle the opening of new coal and gas projects. In fact, there are 89 coal, oil or gas projects sitting in a construction pipeline. Excuse the pun. Now, these projects have either been publicly announced or they are in the feasibility stage and they are worth around $274 billion to the national economy. They would also create nearly half a million jobs. They would provide decades, decades of secure energy supplies. But the government is determined not to use the coal we have or the gas. They're determined not to open up gas fields. And if that's, if that's their plan, if that's their vision, then the only way to lower energy prices in the long term, in the long term, is to add nuclear power to the mix. Now, the United Australia Party does not, does not accept the flippant responses of government ministers whenever the suggestion of nuclear power is raised that, oh, it's, it's just too hard or, oh, it's too expensive, oh, it's too difficult. That's what we're told. Well, it's not too hard. There is a middle ground, a place where different ideas meet and the Australian people benefit. What is too hard, though? What is too hard is watching the average Australian suffer under massive cost of living pressure and skyrocketing energy bills while a very real, tried, tested, safe and proven solution is staring at us right in the face. Now, Australian consumers, Australian businesses, Australian manufacturers, they deserve reliable, abundant and cheap energy. Without cheap energy, we will see a decrease in our standard of living. That, that is just the facts. It will happen. Now, irrespective of whether this bill passes today or not, and we all know it is likely to pass, the United Australia Party asks the government to initiate a genuine study on the costs and benefits of nuclear power. It should analyse emissions, cost to users, cost to government. Now, the Labor Party's 12-month price cap mechanism is a short-term cure that may well be worse than the disease. We need a permanent solution to keep prices down. Now, the UAP took to the election um, a nuclear policy because we're committed to the long-term future of our country. 
and that the time for an honest debate on nuclear power is now. We need to plan for stable power prices into our future without the need for repeated emergency relief measures. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak against the Treasury Laws Amendment Energy Price Relief Plan Bill. It's never the lie that's the problem, it's always the cover-up. And this legislation is the cover-up for the embarrassment of the 97 untruths the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese spoke during the election campaign when he promised to reduce Australians' power bills. This bill will not reduce Australians' power bills. Not before Christmas, not next year, not the year after that. It's not an ideologue saying that. It is just a fact. But this bill has much greater significance for our nation than a political stitch-up to hide the litany of lies to the Australian people. History and economics tells us that controlling prices doesn't work. Sounds good. It actually doesn't work. The most notable in recent times was the attempt to set a floor price for wool in the 80s. When the floor price failed and was abandoned, the Australian industry was left with a stockpile of between four and six billion bales of wool and a debt of $2.7 billion back in the days where $2.7 billion was a lot of money. But history is littered with examples. In the latter part of the Roman Empire, um, when, according to the Edict of Diocletian, a study of price fixing in the Roman Empire, the price cap on gold contributed to massive currency devaluation and inflation and a collapse in the economy. In the 1970s, when President Nixon announced price controls on gasoline, that resulted in a sustained national shortage and rationing. Economic history tells us that price controls dampen investment and growth, create unintended disorder distortions, worsen poverty outcomes and cause countries to incur heavy fiscal burdens. And wiser heads in this country, the experts uh, that have already been mentioned, are waking up to this. News Limited commentator Terry McCran says the cap on coal and gas shows zero understanding of how the electricity market actually works and even less understanding of reality. And I quote, nowhere in this multi-billion package is there the slightest effort to increase supply? And worse, so mind-bogglingly worse, the package is actually designated to encourage less supply, while at the same time aiming to boost demand. Now, whether you're talking eggs, milk or electricity, decreasing supply whilst increasing demand will increase price. The Australian's Henry Ergas says the legislation gives the government unfettered discretion to set any gas price it chooses. And the AFR today, favourite headline of the week, Labor's true spots are now on show. While Anthony Albanese tried to present a pro-business face to the Australian people before the federal elections, eight months after coming to office, Labor's true spots are now on show. First, there was the retro industry-wide patent bargaining workplace shake-up. Now they're trying to ram through um, emergent, the electricity bill. Labor is reverting to its worst anti-business, pro-regulation, big government instincts. Hardly the mantle of hawk that the Prime Minister tried to tell us he was after. A lot more like Whitlam's. Thank you, Senator Canavan. You saw that one coming. <laughs> but first of all, this bill gives the Labor government unprecedented, unchecked and dangerous powers to interfere and intervene in energy markets, long beyond the 12 months nominated by this bill. That means that when it doesn't work, because it won't, Labor will double down and intervene even further. Wait for it. Um, that is what is going to happen. And this will further damage and smash our international reputation as a suitable and safe place to invest due to the stability and predictability of the laws of commerce that this country is supposed to run by. Instead, contracts will be tur turned up torn up, agreements reneged on and confidence in government shattered. Secondly, this bill is a repudiation of our entire economic system. And after hearing Senator McKim's contribution, we know why. Because you know what? He's, he reckons socialism's all right. He reckons socialism's all right, said here. So the Labor Party, the left wing of the Labor Party, 
is in charge of this government, teaming up with the socialists from the Greens, and we have a bill before us that is going to wreak havoc and is a complete repudiation of our economic system, a repudiation of free market policies, the laws of physics, how you generate electricity and how you distribute it, the rule of law and the laws of economics. Following the fall of communism, and that is a political system that actually does reject all of those things, has resulted in an expansion of wealth around the world. You don't like to hear it, but the very economic model you de deride and seek to dismantle is the very economic model that has lifted millions of people around the world out of poverty. It has made sure that my kids had a much better uh, you know, economic life than I did and like my parents before me. For decades, we've seen our whole communities lifted out of poverty and our living standard increased. And it's doubly concerning that you hear, you know, their other mates, the ACTU, can't wait to dismantle the Productivity Commission I read today. Why? Why? I see you laughing, Senator Cash. I know it's shocking. Because the Productivity Commission uh, you know, adopts failed models of economics. Failed models of economics. The very models of economics that means Australians are wealthier now than they have ever been. That is just a fact. Having negotiated a mandatory uh, code on prices as a minister in the dairy industry, I can tell you the number one thing you don't try and do uh, is do it without consulting industry. Because what's good for the Queensland dairy industry may not be great for the Victorian dairy industry, who's more export focused. So if you're going to get a mandatory code of conduct right, consult industry. Guess what? Pretty hard to do. Pretty hard to do when you only finished drafting the legislation last night. Only got it off for um, the, off to the opposition by 8:47 last night, and today you have absolutely showed your disrespect for any scrutiny of that legislation and its unintended consequences. So instead of negotiating with um, industry, this Labor government has done an in deal entirely with its mates, the Greens and Senator Pocock, socialists one and all, who I'm advised didn't even see the legislation. They were so desperate to do the deal. Bant couldn't wait to sign up. So you're going to have Bowen and Bant rocking up at your door, spanners in hand. Let me take out your cooktop. Let me take out your cooktop and your gas barbecue. Uh, there goes the barbecue. You if you've got a gas bottle in the shed because you like to go camping on the weekends, they're going to take that away as well. They could not wait. Lay so desperate were they to cinch a deal and be relevant. But Labor never learns, always returning to the big government interventionist Whitlam model. Just how similar this situation is to the Whitlam government's attempt in 73 to change our constitution to give the Commonwealth powers over price and income. They went to the referendum. Guess what the Australian people said? You know what, boss? No thanks. Lowest yes vote in history and failed in each and every state when you're bothered to go and ask Australians, do you want government fixing prices of everything? No thanks, said Australians. But you haven't done that and you haven't given the chance for the people's representatives to actually scrutinise it. Henry Ergas warns today the bill will get us to where Whitlam wanted us by stealth. I'd like to quote from the late great Doug Anthony on the 16th of May 73, responding to the Whitlam government's Price Justification Act that forced large businesses to justify their price and price rises, and I quote, it is economic madness for the government to attempt to remove the legal obstacles to in industrial anarchy while at the same time calling for price restraint. It is economic madness to expect an uncoordinated and hastily erected maze of price restraint devices to alter the basic realities of the present inflation problem in Australia. Doug Anthony could have been talking about the Albanese Labor government in 2022 with its industrial legislation opening the door to greater industrial disputation and now draconian controls on energy producers. He promised to be Hawke, but he's actually going to be Whitlam. 
And I just want to finally um, again quote Ergas. Whether it this much, however, is certain. The psalmist's warning, put not your trust in princes, remains every bit as relevant today as when the electorate knocked back Whitlam's grab for power. If parliament understood that, Australia would be a better, safer and more prosperous place. This is simply nothing more than institutional gaslighting by the Albanese government, manipulating the people to question rational, reasonable laws of economics and physics. It needs to be. If history is any teacher, this will be catastrophic for our country and shame on the Australian Labor Party, the Socialist Greens and David Pocock for doing this. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this bill as the Greens spokesperson for resources. Whilst the Greens are supporting this bill, we do so knowing that it can be better. And having a secured and a very important package to help households and businesses transition away from dirty gas. Because what we know is gas is as dirty as coal and needs to stay in the ground. And I'm glad that Senator McKenzie mentioned gaslighting, because that's what the Australian public have been listening to for the last decade, is this gaslighting relationship around how great it is, how great it should be drilled and, and taken out of the ground. So this bill will provide some relief, yes, but what it won't actually do is bring down the prices in a meaningful way, because it doesn't address the core issue, and that is not supply, and that's the gaslighting that the opposition would like us have to believe. The core issue is actually a lack of concrete and a funded plan to transition away from dirty and expensive gas to clean, green, renewable energy, which is actually the cheapest form of energy in Australia. So whilst a price cap and a mandatory code of conduct for the gas industry is welcomed in the short term, the long-term solution is in fact renewable energy. It's not the 114 new coal and gas projects currently in the pipeline, and it's not the $42 billion in subsidies that this government is handing out to the fossil fuel companies on a silver platter, rather than actually investing in renewable energy. It's supporting households and businesses to upgrade their appliances and transition to renewables. It's political donation reform, like my colleague Senator Waters uh, talked about, uh, both today but also in the last sitting. And it's establishing a national transition authority which is the bill that my other colleague, Senator Orman Payne, has introduced. The Greens know that there are long-term solutions and we are fighting for them. But as always, it is the major parties that are lagging behind time and time again and dragging this country down with them. We've seen a decade of denial and now we're seeing more delay. Privatisation has failed to deliver cheaper energy in this country and what privatisation has done has allowed companies to make billions of dollars in profit, which they don't mind, they're not paying any tax on and they're giving their executives big bonuses with. Electricity is an essential service, something that is an inherent part of day-to-day -day living now, something that's so important that should not be in the hands of capitalist interests in this country. These companies only have one thing in mind, and that's about making money. In many circumstances, but especially in this one, the public good must come first before corporate profits. The gluttony of greed of gas companies in this country, as we've heard from Minister Husick. Now, the Victorian government promised to build publicly owned renewable and revive the State Electricity Commission, and the South Australian government is flirting with the idea of reversing some of the privatisation of South Australia's power asset, assets. Now, Western Australia is the only state which has kept its electricity assets under government ownership. Now, make it no secret, I have my issues with the WA government, but this is one area where they've made the right call. Despite the fact that this is only one aspect of energy generation, and a lot of the supply chain is still privately owned. Public ownership can, uh, can go one step further in ensuring that First Nations people own assets as well on their country. Don't forget, when you stand in this chamber every morning, 
This is stolen land. Here in the parliament, wherever you go in this country, this land was stolen, and that's the truth. The land in which these energy companies have their assets on is stolen. The resources that they dig up and drill for is stolen. The wealth that these companies have made is stolen wealth. That you can't get away from. It belongs to us. It belongs to the First Nations people across this country. And we get the absolute pittance of what is made on the spot market and in other places selling this they're being exported overseas. And that's why we're still in disparity of wealth in this country, because we're not being given a fair go. And as we transition away from dirty fossil fuels, not only do mining communities that the, the Nats love to talk about, they need to be supported through a national transition authority. First Nations communities also need to benefit in that, because there's a disparity of wealth, if you don't open your eyes and have a look around your regional towns, the disparity of wealth in those country towns as well. Federal and state and territory governments have to commit at having First Nations owned renewable assets. This is a key to respecting our sovereignty in this country. Giant fossil fuel companies have been getting off light with their behaviour across the supply chain. At one end, we saw <coughs> heartbreaking destruction of the Jukun Gorge by Rio Tinto, the sacred place that held thousands of years of cultural heritage. And frankly, it's an embarrassing lack of consultation by Santos in the recently upheld Tiwi Islands case of the Barossa gas field. Recently, the government handed down its response to the Jukun inquiry, and we look forward to working with the government in implementing these recommendations. On the other end, we see companies making record-breaking profits. They have significant power imbalances when they enter into our communities and they have price hikes that are not controlled. Whilst this code of conduct mainly applies to the wholesale market at the end of the supply chain, it will also have implications for domestic production at the start of the supply chain. And the determination of Barossa is integral in part of this yarn, and part of this story. And it's something that I promise you I will keep talking about free prior and informed consent from gas companies in this chamber. And it was something that I will keep talking about in relation to the approval of environmental plans and the destruction of cultural heritage. It's all part of that. It's all part of balancing the ledger, Senator Scar. So we understand and indeed hope that this code of conduct will be far wide reaching in reining in some of these giant tax dodging greedy corporations but ultimately we over here at the Australian Greens know that the true solution is to stop propping up this industry and transition away from co dirty coal and gas and the time to do this is today and now thank you thank you acting deputy president you know, if you are listening to the Liberals, this bill is about shutting down the gas industry. It's about turning down jobs, turning down investment. This bill is economic vandalism. If you, are, if you were to listen to the Labor Party, this bill is about ushering in a new clean energy revolution. It's the start of a bright new day where everybody's bills are cheap, everyone's energy is clean and everyone's conscience is clear. In reality, it's neither of those. I'll support it all the same because it's going to make it possible for people to feel less pain when they come to pay their bills. I say it makes it possible because it can't be guaranteed, because this piece of legislation does not guarantee anything. It's half done. How will people get their bills subsidised? That's still to be determined. Which small businesses will get help on their bills? That's still to be determined. What's the definition of small business? That's still to be determined as well. How much money is every eligible household going to receive? To be determined. Most of this bill isn't actually even a bill. It's just a shell, designed to be filled in later when we've got more information. What is in this bill is pretty slim. There's a $1.5 billion compensation fund from the Commonwealth which will go to subsidies for people's bills if they're on a payment like family tax benefit, job seeker or the DSP. 
but people are on payments, not households. And people in households don't have individual bills. You don't get billed separately if you've got the one connection. So what happens if one person in the house is on a pension and the rest of the household aren't? If the bill isn't in the name of the pensioner but they help pay the bills, do they get help? To be determined. Everything here is to be determined. What's strange about it is that the one bit that the government is fixed on is the amount of compensation they're prepared to put on the table to help households. That's $1.5 billion, matched by each of the states and territories. Not $1.6 billion or $1.4 billion, it's $1.5 billion. That's the right amount, apparently. A dollar more would be irresponsible. A dollar less would be cruel. We're never told why this amount is right, how the Commonwealth landed on this figure. Is it sufficient? Is there anything that suggests it meets the scale of the problem we're facing? Because if there is, we aren't being shown it. And while that amount is capped, it's not the only compensation that the Commonwealth be on the hook to pay because of this bill. Coal-fired power stations don't look like they're going to be compensated too. The cap on prices means that they're not allowed to pass on costs more than $125 per tonne of coal they burn. Some of them are paying more than that for the coal. Anyone paying more for their ingredients than what they're selling their product for won't be in business very long. So it's reasonable that there's compensation. I don't mind that. It's the only way to guarantee that these generators are going to keep generating, which is what we're really needing them to do. But what I don't understand is why nobody can tell us how much compensation they're going to be paid. I'm not against them being paid, but I don't like being asked to vote for something where the price tag comes once you agree to buy it. It's a subsidy no matter what the Greens or the Labor Party say. It's a subsidy going to fossil fuel generators. This bill doesn't write the cheque. What it does is it makes the promise that the cheque is in the mail. So why can't we know how much we're going to be on the hook for? These coal generators are on long-term contracts. The government knows what they're on. They know how much they're generating. Why isn't the coal compensation going to be capped, like the compensation to households and small businesses? Why is there a cap on one and not the other? Nobody can tell us. Why are we being kept in the dark? This isn't the only thing we're in the dark about either. In fact, we didn't see the bill until today. We were asked to come to Canberra with no notice to vote on a bill with no text. There are all reasons why this bill is pretty ordinary and why this process is pretty sloppy. And yet Senator Lambie and I support it, because we know the price that we will be paid if we do nothing, and we know who will pay it. Earlier this week, I went to Murray Bridge in South Australia with some of my fellow senators. We were there for the Community Affairs Reference Committee inquiry into poverty in Australia. We heard firsthand from people living in poverty right now. We heard from those organisations that are helping them. Food Bank SA told us that in Murray Bridge there was a 21 per cent increase in people walking through the door in the last year. We also heard that rents went up by a couple of hundred dollars in the last year. People's wages aren't going up by the same amount, so people are having to cut back. People are showering once a week because they can't afford to pay their bills. The soaring cost of living means people are making difficult decisions about how to feed their children. People are making decisions about which meals they themselves will be skipping, and they're living in their cars. They're not filling scripts for life-saving medication. Some can't even afford Panadol. We've heard stories like this for months now. People are struggling now. They have bills they can't afford now. I think about them and I think about what a 30 per cent increase in their bills next year means for them. I think about what they're supposed to cut to pay for that. I honestly do not know what we expect them to go without. What can they spare to lose? What do they have that we think is too much? Murray Bridge is not unique. Poverty doesn't exist in a little bubble an hour's drive from Adelaide. People across Australia are finding it harder and harder to make ends meet. We know the bills have flaws. It's incomplete. It's been rushed. It's not an ideal situation we are in right now, but at the end of the day, Senator Lambie and I won't stand in the way of making life just that little bit easier for people who are doing it really tough right now. What I know is that if you are struggling, every little bit counts. 
This bill isn't going to give enough relief from the rise in energy costs, but it's something. We can't let the perfect, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and that's why I'm supporting this bill. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, <clears throat> Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment Energy Price Relief Plan Bill 2022. The Greens recognise that cost of living relief is so desperately needed, and that's why we are supporting this bill. Unfortunately, though, despite the fuss and despite the dramatic resummoning of Parliament, under Labor's plan, energy bills will still keep rising, albeit a little bit less than they would have otherwise. The government's own numbers illustrate that their plan is an inadequate solution. Without the plan, Treasury had forecast electricity bills will rise next financial year by 36 per cent. As a result of the legislation we are debating today, the increase next year will still be 23 per cent. <coughs> and a combined increase of 47 per cent over the next two years. So, of course, this scheme, this plan, this legislation is not enough, and there is much, much more to do. This legislation did, though, present the government with a really good opportunity to freeze power bills, which at the moment they have missed. The government should really listen to the Greens and freeze power bills for two years, and we will keep pushing for this freeze so people can have much more meaningful cost of living relief. To, pr to provide further and more long-term cost of living relief and to move away from dirty and expensive gas, the Greens have secured a substantial package with the government that will help households and businesses to switch from gas to cleaner and cheaper energy. And as part of this package, the government will focus on low- and middle-income earners, renters, and those in public housing. And this is, this is definitely a win for households and also a win for the climate. And it is a big blow for greedy gas corporations. I want to be crystal clear that we will not support a single cent of so-called compensation for coal corporations. Coal and gas corporations should, in fact, be compensating us for the massive climate damage that they have done, which is cooking the planet, not the other way around. Governments should not be propping up coal and gas with public money. We should be ending it. Projects like the Pilliga Narrabri gas, uh, gas Project in New South Wales and the Beetaloo Basin Project in the Northern Territory are climate crimes just waiting to happen. They must be scrapped. They destroy sovereign lands and forests while polluting water and air. The Labour government really needs to show the leadership and courage that is needed to deliver the big, bold solutions that this energy price crisis demands. Because the reality is this. This isn't a short-term dilemma sparked by the war in Ukraine. This is a crisis caused by neoliberal policy perpetuated by both the major parties at a state and a federal level over the past 30 years and fueled by the greed of profit-bloated, morally bankrupt fossil fuel corporations. Major parties take dirty donations, then give these corporations criminally cheap access to our publicly owned resources. Some of these corporations pay no royalties or tax, and then they get billions in subsidies handed to them in a platter. Meanwhile, these corporations, whose business model has been to fuel climate change denialism, purchase favorable government policy, and profit of climate catastrophe, have been raking in record profits. Research shows that the gas sector has accrued a staggering $26 billion in profit due to, Ukra due to the Ukraine war fueled price rises. That is absolutely disgraceful. We, uh, what, we need urgently, what we need urgently is a windfall profit tax to rein these corporations in. This should not be controversial. Even the conservative UK government has introduced a windfall tax to fund cost of living relief. So what's stopping Senator our allegedly Canavan. progressive Labour government 
I interjections are disorderly. Sorry, Senator Faruqi, can you just resume your seat for a minute? Senator Canavan. Senator Canavan, interruptions are disorderly. Please listen quietly. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. A windfall profit tax should not be controversial. Even the Conservative UK government has introduced a windfall tax to fund cost of living relief. So what's stopping our allegedly progressive Labour government from doing what Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz has called a no-brainer? It is a no-brainer. This government, like the last one, is beholden to fossil fuel and energy companies. It should be the other way around. Privatisation of our electricity and energy grid has been disastrous, not just for affordability, but for the pace of the clean energy transition. We must bring our resources and energy assets back into public hands. Essential services, whether they be education, health or energy, should never be run for profit, and private companies should never have the power to hold us to ransom like they have. Coal and gas corporations exist for one thing, for making profit from environmental exploitation and destruction. Their greed and appetite for resources is insatiable. They are killing the planet. So the solution isn't treating these corporations as good faith players who deserve compensation. The solution is recognizing that they have long ago forfeited their social license to exist at all. So yes, the Greens will leave no stone unturned to end coal and gas. So our planet and all who live on it actually can have a future. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, Senator Caranavan. Speak, but I just want to make a brief contribution uh, on, the, on really the state of the chamber today. And it's, uh, it's uh, been my observation today that the Labor Party has been very subdued today because, as the Prime Minister has said, as the Prime Minister, he is stunned. He's stunned that we are here and fighting for the Australian people. He thought he thought he'd come here with his tired and simplistic politics and just have the whole chamber roll over. Well, I've got a message to the Labor Party today. We're going to fight. We're going to fight for the Australian people. We're going to fight for Australian jobs that rely on our great resources industry. We're going to fight to make sure we maintain our reputation in this country as a country that can be relied upon, that you can come here and do business in this nation without having this kind of abuse of parliamentary process, which shatters all certainty for businesses. So I understand the Labor Party's shock today that we would do this, that we would actually have the steel to stand behind our convictions. Because perhaps, perhaps over the past uh, couple of decades or ever since the Howard government, that hasn't happened here in Canberra enough. But this is a new opposition today in this chamber, and we will keep fighting for it. And as much as the Labor Party have escaped scrutiny today through this, through this uh, shocking gag, three and a half hours of consideration to some of the most major changes to our economic policies in decades. As much as I'll be succeeding today, I've got a message. You're not going to succeed in the months ahead. We're going to have estimates now, even though you tried to get rid of those. We're going to have inquiries. We're going to follow you every step of the way, because from right now, from right now, every, every price rise is on your head. Every blackout is on your head. Every struggling family that is struggling to pay their bills is because of the mess you are creating here today, and we will not cease and, and, and rest until we get justice for the Australian people and make sure we restore our reputation as a country that can be relied upon for sensible economic policy making. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Gallagher. And I, um, I thank the Senate uh, for contributions. I will just respond to uh, Senator Canavan. Um, uh, we have uh, assisted the chamber by not having speakers from the government side to allow to allow, well, to allow, Senator Scar. I listen to everyone else in silence. To to allow other senators, including those opposite, to make a contribution on the on this bill, um, and it's those opposite that choose to chew up the first half an hour without make, without actually dealing with the bills. But if I can, these bills are designed specifically to alleviate pressure on households, to stand up for jobs, to stand up for industry, to stand up for manufacturing. There's been a very, very select use of, of uh, industry comments 
uh, in the contributions from those opposite. And I could take the full 15 minutes to read out the quotes and examples from businesses, small and large, in this country who are going to the wall because of the gas prices, because of energy prices, the lost jobs that are being threatened, the businesses that have lasted for 50 years that are now being hammered, and, and those opposite want to ignore all that. No, nothing, no problem with that at all. Absolutely no problem with the price of gas at the moment and the, uh, what we've seen over the last Sorry, six months. Sorry, Minister, can you just resume your seat? Senator Scar, I have already asked you to at least lower your voice, although all interjections are disorderly. So if you could thank you. And Senator Canavan, you as well. Interjections are disorderly. So if the minister could just continue her contribution in silence, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Canavan also mentioned price increases. Um, well, 20 per cent, the increases that we have factored in already that are hitting households and businesses now are the increases that happened on your watch. And that is absolutely the truth, fact, and everyone understands it. Ten years of failed energy policies, of delay, dysfunction, inability to land an energy policy that saw us inherit an energy system in crisis, yes, impacted by the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia, but also the fact that our energy system wasn't resilient or robust enough to deal with the transition that is occurring worldwide in the economy. Now, we are standing up for our national economic interest, absolutely. We understand that some of the companies are unhappy with the measures that are outlined in this bill but they have different responsibilities to ours. We have a responsibility as a government to deal with the situation that is, has been unfolding over the last six months, to look at the impact on jobs, to look at the impact on small business, large business, our big manufacturers, and to look at the impacts on household, to look at what's happening with the states and territories and the pressures that they are under. That is our job. And part of what we're doing works alongside the Powering Australia plan, which we took to the last election, and which those opposite think is such a joke. Well, it's not a joke. An orderly transition to the biggest economic transformation that is occurring, and you want to put your head in the sand and pretend it's not happening and pretend that a shift to renewables, the cheapest form of energy, available shouldn't happen. That is your approach. It's not the approach of the government. Now, I am not going to take up all of my time, although I am tempted, um, because I do want to deal with uh, some of the issues that have been raised. So I would like to thank senators um, on the eve of Christmas, almost, for coming back and for dealing with this bill. I tried to acknowledge that at the beginning. I would also like to thank senators who have contributed to the debate. The bill contains measures which contribute to stabilising gas prices in times of significant volatility in global energy markets. Without any intervention, retail gas prices are expected to increase by 20 per cent in 2023-24, and retail electricity prices are expected to increase by 36 per cent in 2023-24. High wholesale gas prices impact industrial and commercial customers' viability and result in households ultimately paying higher prices for electricity, gas and goods. The government is committed to ensuring Australian consumers and businesses have access to an adequate supply of gas at reasonable prices. Schedule 1 of the bill will amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010, providing an enabling framework to facilitate a gas market code to address systemic issues in the market, including a reasonable price provision and an emergency cap on wholesale gas prices for 12 months. Schedule 2 to the bill will amend the Federal Financial Relations Act 2009 to introduce a new type of payment to the states and territories to support temporary and targeted relief on energy bills for eligible households and small businesses. It will provide an appropriation of $1.5 billion to be paid as financial assistance to the states and territories who will jointly fund the relief and administer the payments under a new funding agreement. 
The inclusion of a reasonable pricing provision in the gas market code is to provide a basis for producers and buyers to negotiate domestic wholesale gas contracts at reasonable prices. The temporary emergency price cap is intended to ensure domestic industry remains viable and to limit energy price rises for households and businesses. The government intends the cap to be set at a level that reflects the cost of production and which preserves a reasonable rate of return on investment. The impact of these measures is to lower wholesale electricity prices by 30 per cent in 2023-24. This will bring down power costs for businesses and families across Australia compared to what they would have been otherwise without our package of measures. The government has conducted modelling to determine the impact of our policy. However, modelling, and this relates to some questions Senator McKim asked, that however, modelling that delivers impacts on the revenue of projects by technology has not been conducted, not least because project revenues are also impacted by the contracts project contracts projects have signed, including power purchasing agreements, which are common for the renewable energy projects in particular. The fact is our policies will not undermine or change the fundamental economics of investment decisions. These policies will not change the fact that firmed renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy and presents the most attractive investment for investors. The energy price relief plan, of which, the bill, of the, which this bill is a part, is designed to mitigate the impact of Russia's illegal war on Ukraine on energy, Australian energy prices, and after this intervention, we will continue to see the transformation of our energy system to more renewable energies, just as we saw before the, Rus the Russian invasion. Of course, the main difference between the situation for renewable energy after our package is implemented and before Russia's hor uh, horrific war is the fact that now, unlike pre-February 2022, we have a Commonwealth government committed to working with states, supporting renewable investment, including by modernising our electricity transmission network through rewiring the nation, as well as recently agreed capacity investment scheme, which will deliver $10 billion worth of investment in dispatchable renewable and storage capacity. The agreement stuck with, struck with states at National Cabinet will see the states leading on the implementation of coal price ceilings in their jurisdiction. In particular, this affects New South Wales and Queensland. And in order to implement a price ceiling uh, for coal used in power generation to bring wholesale prices down, contracted coal will need to be addressed. We are working with the state governments on this issue, and it's still subject of negotiation and further analysis. Negotiations on those funding arrangements are currently underway for each state and territory. But the answer to the questions from Senator McKim is it is still too early to provide any further details as those negotiations are all ongoing. But of course, if, our, um, if further uh, um, appropriations or financial assistance is required, then the appropriations would have to be dealt with in the, in using stand, you know, standard processes either in the budget or in a special appropriation. But none of those decisions have been taken at this point. Um, the fact remains that the faster we can deliver on our renewable energy potential, the lower price power prices will be and the less we will be exposed to the volatility of coal and gas prices. That is the longer term solution and the longer term game, game plan and there is no serious disagreement about that. I would also like to thank and acknowledge my, um, my colleagues on the government benches for agreeing not to participate in this debate, uh, but they stand strongly behind uh, the bills that are presented um, to the Senate, by, but I appreciate their assistance in helping to facilitate this afternoon. I commend the bill. Thank you, Minister. The question now is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Dunningham on sheet 1793 now be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Dunningham. We're calling a division. If I can just have the uh, opposition's position supporting that recorded. Thank you. Uh, I'll now move on to the uh, Senator Waters, I understand you foreshadowed your amendment on sheet 1791. Would you like to move it now? Thank you, Acting Deputy uh, President. I so move uh, second reading amendment on 1791. The question now is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Waters on sheet 1791 now be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. 
The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Do I just say lock the doors when the clock's finished? Do I? <laughs> the doors? Uh, just to reiterate for those that weren't in the room, we're voting on um, the amendment by Senator Waters on sheet 1791. I'll call Senator McKim for the eyes and Senator Scar for the nose.
ayes 7, noes 38. The question is resolved in the negative. Oh, sorry, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to have my name recorded as supporting Senator Dunham's uh, second reading amendment. That, that's so done, Senator Roberts. Senator Cash, I believe you have foreshadowed a second reading amendment. Thank you. And I move the second reading amendment on sheet 1789 as circulated in the chamber. I now put the question, should that amendment be agreed to? Those of the opinion say aye. Those of the opinion against say no. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Yes. Division required okay. one minute bell. So the question is that the second reading amendment is moved by Senator Cash on sheet 1789 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
Order. There being 23 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, I understand there are two further second reading amendments. Senator Rustin. Um, could I please move my amendment on sheet 1788? Yes. So moved. So the question is that the amendment, second reading amendment is moved by Senator Rustin on sheet 1788 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Now, Senator Gallagher. Record that the uh, government um, record our yep. opposition to yep. that amendment. We can record the government's opposition. Yeah, the ayes have it. Um, we'll now move to, uh, I think it's a second read amendment standing in your name, Senator McKim. Thank you very much, President. I move the amendment uh, standing in my name on sheet 1792. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that the second reading amendment is moved by Senator McKim on sheet 1792 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Uh, division required. Ring the bells for one minute. So the question is that a uh, second reading amendment is moved by Senator McKim on sheet 1792 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being eight ayes and 44 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative.
The question now is that the motion as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Senators, I've just put a motion. I'm going to put it again. So the question is that the motion as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Do you want me to put it again? So the question is: the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Just relax. So the question is that the second reading as amended be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Burkett, the seller for the ayes, and Senator Askew, a seller for the nose. Order. There being 29 ayes and 24 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 and for other purposes. Change. Um, Senator Van.
Dick. Senator Dunningham. Chair, and uh, look, this is the brave new world of Labor, green, transparent, accountable, scrutinised politics. Here we are, three and a half hours. We've all flown back to Canberra today to pass a bill that Labor and the Greens have the numbers to pass. This is what Australians can now expect as a result of what this crew here are going to do. And they've come in here with this bill purportedly to bring down power prices. Now, I, did have to, I just have to reflect on one thing. During my second reading contribution, I invited the minister in her summing up to make one commitment. That commitment I wanted to have made, reiterated, was I would have loved to have extended hours because we'll come to that in a moment, but I wanted the minister to reiterate the Labor government's commitment to bring power prices down by $275. Those numbers did not pass the minister's lips. In fact, it is a no-go. You are not allowed to say those numbers anymore if you're a Labor MP or senator. Now, I'm looking forward. We tried it at estimates. We've tried it here in this debate. But no, we're not allowed to say it because that promise was never made, except we know it was made 97 <laughs> times in the election, a broken promise. And here we are today duping the people of Australia into thinking this bill is going to fix all their woes. It won't. It won't. So three and a half hours of debate in the Senate. We had over 200 questions to make. During, during this uh, yeah, committee cool. stage, and we have been denied that opportunity. We had Senator several McGrath. coalition senators—Senator Colbeck, Senator Reynolds, Senator, Senator Fawcett, yeah. Senator Little—all wanted to ask questions, all wanted to make contributions on the second reading debate, but no. This crew here, what they did was they truncated debate. They wanted to ram it through. Who knows where they've got to be tonight? I don't know. All under the guise of wanting to bring some cost of living Senator relief, but we know that will not happen. We know this bill will not be able to deliver that for the people of Australia. It's going to go in the opposite direction. And the minister cannot bring herself or any of her colleagues to make the same commitment they made nearly 100 times during the election campaign to bring power prices down by $275. And can I make the point Senator that Watt. this is typical of the Senator politics Watt. that the Australian Labor Party seek to play? And by dismissing concerns Senator from McKenzie. energy analysts and companies that generate power and saying, it's, don't worry about what they've got to say, the real test will be for the Australian Labor Party when the people in the gallery, the people outside this building get their power bills, will they be up or down? They'll be up. We know they'll be up. And you know what? The next question I seek to ask this government is Senator whose Watt. fault will it be then? When power prices Senator are going McAllister. up, is it going to be our fault still? Is it going to be the Ukraine conflict? Or is it going to be someone else's fault? In 2025, when power prices have gone up, in the next month, when Australians are opening their power bills, their electricity bills, their gas bills, who are they going to blame? And this is exactly why we needed more Senator than three and a half hours to debate you. this legislation, to be able to properly interrogate it, to be able to look at whatever deal was done between the Greens and the Labor Party. We don't know. This is the thing. A few Senator sketchy McAllister. details referred to in their contributions to the second reading debate. Perhaps it was the election commitment they took to Senator the election. Maybe this is new policy, now. is it? Labor and the Greens get together, and what they didn't get to get up at the election because they didn't win government, you're now going to give them a licence to do as part of your deals. Are we going to see a climate trigger down the track built into your EPBC legislation? Who knows? I know. It's a wild dream for the Australian Greens, but it's a nightmare for the people of Australia who are going to be paying more for their power bills. This is the simple problem. All of us get out. All of us talk to our family, friends, people that run small to medium businesses. And you know what? I tell you, the blatant disregard for the concerns that normal, everyday Australians have in trying to make ends meet, in trying to make sure that they can pay the bills. And it might be amusing to some in this place because we've all got to get on a plane after 4.30. But in fact, we should be here debating this 
once in a generation opportunity to get it right. You know, Henderson. we are seeing the biggest, most Senator destructive White. and extreme changes to energy regulation in decades, and these have been labelled by experts from the sector as the worst ever seen in the world. Not just here, not in the ACT, not the east coast of Australia, in the world. How can this government ignore these alarm bells? How can the government turn their backs on the people of Australia who are asking for one thing? The one thing you promised at the election. And it's a compact, a contract between you, the government, the people who formed a majority after the last election, and the people of Australia. They voted for you on the basis of your promise that you would reduce power bills by how much, colleagues? And it's a promise you've broken. It's a promise that the Australian government will not deliver. Not through this bill, not through any other mechanism, and it's a number they will not utter. They will go nowhere near because they don't intend to deliver on it. It is a dark day for Australians. It's a dark day for Australians who are already struggling with increasing cost of living pressures. Mortgages, groceries, electricity bills we've already mentioned. And you know, the other thing too, the glee that you see beaming out of the faces of the Australian Greens should be enough to tell all of us that this is a dud deal for Australians. And now the heads go down because this crew down here, the Australian Greens, are not known for their support of Australian industries, Australian jobs, things like fossil fuels that actually do generate energy at the moment. And I made the point in my second reading speech, you deny reality. You can't switch the old system off without switching the new one on. The new one hasn't been switched on yet. We don't have capacity to generate energy. So when we have to choose between who gets the gas and who doesn't, is it the children ward at the hospital or the house? Who gets heating in winter? This is what's going to happen. The blackouts, the price spikes, all of these things are going to come. This is not some scare tactic. This is what's going to happen. It's what experts in the sector are saying. It's what analysts are predicting. And there are ways to fix this. There are ways to deal with it. If the government went out and spoke to the industry and, and spoke to the sector and consulted, right. if the government went out and spoke to people who are struggling with cost of living, they would do more than what this bill proposes to do. They would actually go and deliver on their election commitment, which I can only assume was made on the basis of good faith consultation with the community. So it begs the question again, why break the promise? $275, I say to the minister who is in the chair at the moment. I wonder whether it still remains government policy, but at the end of the day, I want Australians to know this government has duped you yet again. You were fooled into voting for them based on a promise for $275. And I, I take the interjections from Senator, Senator Watt. Watt. I tell you what, Senator Watt. When a government lies to the people of Australia, like this one has, around a promise to cut $275 off their power bill, Senator and White. not once since the election has any single member of the front bench or the back bench referenced that number, why would that Senator not Gallo. actually be something that you would do? Is it not what a good government would do? actually honour a commitment it made 97 times? I think that's the kind of thing I'd be expecting. I reckon it's the people that voted for your government are expecting as well. Why won't you deliver on that promise? Why won't you reference that in anything that you do? I have a lot more to ask you before my time is up, Senator Gallagher, and I will continue to ask those questions because I'm angry on behalf of the people of Australia who are going to pay higher power bills because of this decision by the Senate today, frankly. And anyone who thinks that this is just something that will go away, I guarantee you, over time, and I said it, and Senator Cash too said it in the debate, there's one test that you're all going to be facing in coming months and, in fact, at the next election. It's that one thing that we are all going to be looking at. We all pay power bills. We all pay for gas. We all pay for those essential services. Will those bills be going up? Or will they be going down? And I have a feeling they're going to be going up. And you know what? 
just you can check, chalk off at the end of this year. Oh, yeah. we got our optics up. We've rushed this bill through. We called yeah. people back to Parliament. But frankly, in reality, we'll have done nothing for the people of Australia except make their lives harder. Make it harder to pay bills. Make it harder for Australians to actually keep food on the table and keep the lights on and the heating on come winter. And the most alarming thing, as I said before, I look down the end here at the Australian Greens who are beaming with happiness today because that is a sign they got what they wanted. The people of Australia have been done it again because a minority are directing what this government does. But when you actually reduce power pills, 275 bucks, it'll be a happy day. And I'll be the first to congratulate you on what you do. Uh, Senator Gallagher. There was a few questions. There was a few questions in there, but I think the contribution from Senator Dunham uh, just confirms that uh, the opposition has dealt themselves out of being part of any sensible policy dialogue in the energy area. That, uh, it, that presentation has just confirmed it. We will deliver on our Powering Australia plan, but unlike you, we are also taking the urgent, the urgent steps that are needed to take the, the sting out of the increases that are being felt right across the country in households, in manufacturers, in small and medium businesses. And this response is a sensible and meaningful and responsible response to the current energy crisis, fuelled by the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia, but also at your feet. And we will not let you forget it, as you are voting for higher energy prices and higher costs for households, and you want to see businesses go to the wall, that's what you're voting today. That's the position you have chosen. We are on this side where we want to see those prices come down and people be given that assistance. That's what you're voting against today. You've dealt yourself out of being any kind of respectful or reasonable uh, policy, you know, or politicians involved in sensible policy debates. It's absolutely pathetic. You've been sitting there complaining that you weren't given the opportunity and wasting the time that we had available to you today. You made the choices and you've drawn up the gal ground. Well, we, what Australian people will realise is Order! Order on my left! Thank you. Minister. Australian people will understand, this is the question that Senator Dunian put to me, that they have a government that is on their side, that is prepared to make difficult calls and to pe prepared to make the decisions and pass legislation that will take the sting out of these increases in energy prices that we inherited from you and that are forecast to impact on 23-24. Order to my left. Senators, it being 4.30 p.m., I will now put the questions on the circulated amendments and then the remaining stages of the bill. I will first deal with the amendments circulated by Pauline Hanson's One Nation. The question is that the amendment on sheet 1784 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the no's have it. Is a division required? A division is required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question before the chair is that amendment on sheet 1784 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Those against, to the left of the chair, I appoint teller for the ayes, Senator Askew, and teller for the noes, Senator Ciccone. Honourable Senators, there being 25 ayes and 28 noes, it's passed in the negative. I now will deal with the amendments circulated by the opposition on sheet 1787. I alert honourable members before I put the question that the question will be that Schedule 1 standards printed. So therefore, if you are supporting the opposition amendments, you would vote no, and if you are supporting the bill, you would vote in the affirmative. I'll now put the question. I put the question. The Schedule 1 standards printed. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Is division required? Division is required. One minute bells. Are the whips happy? One minute bells. Lock the doors. The, the question before the chair is that Schedule 1 standards printed. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Noes to lift the chair. I point teller for the aye, Senator Shikoni. Teller for the no, Senator Askew.
honourable senators, there being 29 ayes and 23 noes, it is resolved in the affirmative. I note that the remaining amendment on sheet 1787 was consequential on the previous amendment. Is someone seeking leave to withdraw the consequential amendment? No one is seeking leave. Therefore, I will put the question. The question is now that the remaining amendment on sheet 1787 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Bring the bills for one minute. One minute. The bills be rung for one minute. Lock the doors. The, the question before the chair is that the remaining amendment on sheet 1781 be agreed to. Those to the question pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left of the chair. Appoint as teller for the ayes, Senator Askew, and teller for the noes, Senator Shikoni. Honourable Senators, there being 24 ayes and 27 noes, it's passed in the negative. Pursuant to order, I shall now report the bill. Honourable Senators, the committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment Energy Price Relief Plan Bill 2022 and agreed to it without amendment. Senators, it now being after 4.30 p.m., I will now put the question with the amendment circulated by the opposition to the motion that the report from the committee be adopted. So the question is, so that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. The ayes shall pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone as teller for the noes. Order. There being 25 ayes and 26 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bills be now passed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Giacconi as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes.
order. There being 28 ayes and 22 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 and for other purposes. Senators, that concludes consideration of the bill, and I call the minister. Thank you, uh, President. I move that the Senate, at its rising, adjourn till Monday, the 6th of February, 2023, at 10 a.m. Or as such other time that, as may be fixed by the president, or in the event of the president becoming unavailable by the deputy president, and that the time of meeting so determined shall be notified to each senator, and that leave of absence be granted to every member of the Senate from the end of the sitting day to the day on which the Senate now meets. Merry Thank you. Merry the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Yeah. So the question is: the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Yes.